welcome everybody to the meeting. We're dealing with H915. And uh, Wendell, you're the first one. You're right. Wendell. Warren. 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 Oh, Warren Coleman, Wendell Coleman, right? Yeah. Is it totally? Yeah. yeah, he was a legislator. You didn't oh, know that? No. No. Did you like him or no? Someday. <laughs> He wasn't as good a guy as you. Okay. Yes. yes. That's what I, mean. <laughs> uh, I can. I can be real, uh, real brief. Uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Warren Coleman. I'm from MMR, and we're here. We represent the Vermont Golf Association. Um, we did testify up in the House on the original bill. Um, uh, I think you'll see that the bill changed substantially and was narrowed to deal with uh, deal with the treated seeds. Um, so at this point, the, the the Vermont Golf Association doesn't seem to be uh, implicated by you know, by the current bill, so we don't have any, don't have any concerns about the, the bill as it's before you. Oh, you don't have any. Uh, yeah, and the only thing we talked about uh, in regards to this bill uh, is we were we've had some discussions in Ryan Moore in regards to trying to get. Uh, the people that, that manufacture these seeds. Um, I think what we've heard, and you guys correct me if I'm getting obligation, <coughs> there's basically uh, four major ingredients that go into treated seeds. And there's only one, the higher one, that has an effect on population and we were I mean, just batting it around Margaret may be able to help us with this but we were thinking if we could get seeds manufactured on the market for sale with that one missing this whole thing would go away and then we haven't had enough testimony yet to really figure out if that is accurate or not. But uh, as far as the golf courses in the in the sprays, I don't think you know got a dog in the place. No, not as the bill's currently in front of you. We, we could probably find one to put in here in the golf. <laughs> <laughs> I'd appreciate it if you didn't. <laughs> oh I thought <laughs> I thought you might want to earn your money. Oh or I, I am next door in some oh. of your uh, in some of your <laughs> other committees, believe me. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you, yes. uh, Lord. And, yep. and uh, you know, keep an eye on this. I will. If uh, if uh, as we move forward if there's something you want to okay. chat about. Okay, we'll definitely pay attention to it. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you, sir. I guess Margaret, you're a sucker. Yeah. Maybe you you could tell us a little bit about the different. Okay. Yeah. Can we, yeah. You know, um, so I'm going to start with who I'm here that I'm supposed to be testifying for, and then I'll move on to the people that you actually might be interested in hearing from as well, because I don't yeah. both. So for the record, I'm Margaret Lagas. I represent Green Mountain Dairy Farmers. Um, they are the dairy farmers in Vermont that ship to milk cooperatives. Um, uh, I went to all of the pollinator protection uh, committee meetings over the last couple of years. Um, and basically what came out of those meetings were that there were four or five main stressors to bees. And it was worldwide, not just here in Vermont, but worldwide. Um, but in Vermont specifically, um, the, the two big ones, see, or the, the three big ones, were a lack of genetic diversity, um, which makes the bees more susceptible to individual problems if you don't have that hybrid vigor of a, of a, a diverse genetic background. Climate change is a big one with earlier springs, you know, um, snowfalls happening at bad times, very rainy springs, cool springs, um, those uh, make bees struggle. And another problem is a lack of early forage. <clears throat> and one of the big changes that occurred in Vermont uh, maybe five or six years ago was that uh, the research uh, for dairy farmers showed that early harvesting of alfalfa 
which has obviously got a, a clover, you know, it's got a flower and early bloom, which was an important source of uh, nutrients for bees. Um, what the research showed was that if dairy farmers cut the alfalfa before the bloom, the available nutrients to their cows were actually higher and more efficient. And so farmers started cutting their um, alfalfa earlier, which kind of was taking away this early source of uh, a high quality feed source for bees. Um, there is research at UVM now going on to uh, different types of those forages that you could allow to bloom and not lose the nutrient content. Um, so we are looking at that. Um, but one of the other issues is that we have all these new um, buffer zones coming in because of the now only two-year-old RAPs, the required ag practices, um, require farmers that have any kind of a waterway near their farm to have buffer zones. So those are a great opportunity um, to pro provide early forage for bees as well. And now there is also a bill about solar farms um, and trying to use them as a source of forage for bees as well. And they have a pollinator, um, a friendly, a pollinator friendly solar siting bill um, that's moving through as well. Um, varroa mites have been a constant problem. I worked for the House and Senate Act Committees in DC in the late 80s and early 90s, um, and that was part of the 1990 Farm Bill was research money into varroa mites. And those are um, a little parasite that gets onto the bees and um, you know it uh, weakens them. The only way to get rid of them is to treat them with an insecticide. Obviously bees are insects, and so you're, there's that fine balance of treating <coughs> enough to try to control the varroa mites but not harming your bees. Um, and that has been an ongoing constant uh, battle. There, there was a queen bee that was uh, developed in Vermont by a Vermont breeder. Um, and um, she actually, in her method of cleaning, she actually was killing the varroa mites, which other bees weren't. So they have taken her and are um, trying to um, use her genetics. Um, there's, a, there's a bee cooperative that deals with uh, breeding and uh, diversifying the genetics of bees, I believe Tennessee somewhere. Um, and they are using her to try to get that genetic trait to carry out into other bees, which would be a way for bees to help protect themselves against these varroa mites. Um, like I said, climate change is a huge issue, um, and pesticides is, is another issue. Um, bees are insects, and they obviously can be negatively impacted by pesticides. Um, so the pesticide that you all are interested here in this bill is uh, neonicotinoids. There are basically four different ones out there. Um, when a dairy farmer in Vermont buys corn seed, if you're not an organic farmer, you're buying corn seed that comes pre-treated, and basically it has three or four different elements, whether it's a fungicide, an insecticide, um, or a larvicide, there are a variety of different things. It's a recipe that different companies come up with, um, so the various different corn seed companies and corn sellers have their own private recipe, their own special ingredients, special sauce um, that they put onto seeds, and originally, um, some of these seed coatings at the time of planting would have what we call the dust off issue, which is, you know, we pour um, a bag of corn seed into a hopper, and the way that it went in, there was an air injection system, and the air injection would actually cause some of that seed coating to become airborne, and that caused these pesticides to not end up where they belonged, which was in the soil. Um, the secondary problem was that um, in order to keep the seeds from sticking together, they used a product kind of like a talc product, like a baby powder kind of a product. They kept the seeds from sticking together and they found out that it was just rough enough that it was also causing some of the seed coating to rub off and become airborne, which we didn't want, right? We want those products to be in the soil where they belong, that's where they're targeted to be. Um, so the seed coatings and the planter boxes have both been changed um, over the years. Obviously not every farmer changes right away, but in Vermont, most farms um, hire somebody to do the commercial uh, planting of their corn, um, and so those large growers are changing their equipment much more rapidly than an individual farmer would. And so most of those pieces of equipment have been changed, and the seed coatings have been changed. You know, I, I likened it to like uh, M&Ms, where you know they melt in your mouth and not in your hand. And so they've come up with a coating that is not as susceptible to the dust off, and they use a different product to keep the seeds from sticking together. So they they have tried to adjust both of those issues that they found and what they have found is there's significantly less of the dust off issue and so more of the insecticide goes into the ground where it's needed. Um, and the issue of not having the insecticide on the seed doesn't lessen the need for this insecticide. We do have these wire worms in Vermont. Um, and the problem is, so it kills wire worms is what it is, that the neonics are, are specifically designed. The thing that bothers the bees? So this, this particular insecticide that goes after wire worms is one that um, it is a targeted insecticide, but bees are insects and so they are 
susceptible to it because it's what they call systemic. And so it gets into the main part of the plant and is also um, shows up in the pollen of plants. Um, and so you've seen that most uh, annual plant companies, um, the big uh, proven winners, anybody who goes out and buys annuals to plant in their gardens, the biggest um, proprietary uh, owner of those, of that, those patents are what's called proven winners, and they've gone away from using neonics because obviously all of their plants are bee attractive, and so they don't want to use neonics on them. Um, but yes, this, the, this particular insecticide um, can have an impact on bees. They're not, they're not entirely sure in small doses what that effect is, but there are a couple of different ones, whether it's how they find their way back to the hive or whether it's just a, a bit of an extra stressor along with the varroa mites and the climate change and the you no know, easy access to a variety of forage. And there's a lot of different things that are all coming together and so it's kind of a package deal. But if you didn't want um, neonics as a seed treatment, then we would go back to what we used to do, which is to apply those seed coatings on the farm. Um, so it would be the same thing. We'd put them in the hopper box. You'd be mixing them on a farm. So you would actually have a better chance of dust off under that scenario. And you would also have much more kind of over the road shipping and, and handling at a farm of a, of a pesticide, which now obviously none of those pesticides are in individual farms around Vermont. But if you ban them as a seed coating, then individual farmers would have to have them. The other issue is, you know, they've talked about no, what they call prophylactic use, which would mean you'd have to prove that you have the problem in order to use the treated seed. Um, there is, um, neonics are not effective once you see the damage done to your plant. Your plant has come up, and so there, there, there is no kind of after the fact treatment. It isn't like other pests that you start to see, um, like armyworms, you start to see them show up and you could treat and you could avoid significant damage to your crops. Wireworm happens before the seed corn comes out of the ground, and so by the time you see the damage, it's too late. Yeah, they're in, they're in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so the other challenge is that, as you know, we talk a lot about how much dairy farming practices have changed in the last 10 years because of water quality issues. Um, so you'll see uh, we're not tilling our soils, we're growing cover crops, um, we're changing the way that we plant things. Um, we have a higher degree of um, organic matter in the soil. You know, one of the things we talk about is in regard to climate change, raising the organic matter in the 500,000 acres of tillable soil in Vermont or, or uh, plant propagation soil in Vermont can absorb the carbon of about 240,000 trucks and vehicles in Vermont. Um, and that is something that we're actually able to do over a short period of time, but it completely changes the soil biota and the amount of bugs and and um, everything that's in the soil of farms because you've got a lot more organic matter in there, which means there's a lot more air, there's more root systems. And so all of that is kind of rapidly changing on Vermont farms. And so we're, and climate change is also significantly impacting Vermont farms. So it's harder and harder to really know whether or not you're gonna have a wireworm issue in September, which is when you would have to get ready to order your seeds for the following spring. Um, and so we don't support the idea of not allowing farmers to to use this insecticide as a seed coating unless they can prove that they've got a problem. And you also might have, you know, one part of a field has a problem, the other doesn't, and then you're carrying multiple bags of seed out to your field and you can only put it in certain hoppers and starting and stopping them. And I think that um, what this bill does, what 915 does, is address the actual issues that exist in Vermont, which is let's, let's take a look at, um, you know, are neonics showing up in waterways? Um, what are the bee issues? Are there other ways that you know that we can use PSAs to make sure that homeowners are not using these products when their um, their flowers are actually blooming? Because you don't want them to be doing that because that's when the bees are attracted to those flowers um, and things like that. Um, and working with farmers on their buffer zones and what can we do to make sure that they don't grow up to woody vegetation, um, which is not as an attractive source of food for many bees um, unless they're the right kind of woody vegetation. Um, so that's, uh, and, and for everybody to remember, neonics, you know, as the EPA always replaces old chemistries, what are, what are supposed to be newer and safer chemistries. Neonics replaced um, organophosphates, which had a negative impact on humans. Um, these are much safer for humans, and so we, we're always trying to get better, and there will be new chemistries coming out. Obviously, the bee issue has been a big nationwide issue. These companies are not immune to that knowledge, and so they will continue to work on either ways to make sure that those um, that their um, chemistries don't show up in places where they don't belong, as in fixing the seed coating and the method of planting. Um, so yeah. Uh, we, 
I don't know if we heard this in committee or what. I was upstairs and they reported it to me. But it seems like we have uh, two major B companies, B owners, and one B owner has a problem or thinks they have a problem, dying bees. But the other one, their, their bees seem to be healthy and fine. And they both work in the same it one's in Addison County, one's in Franklin County. Yeah, yeah. so it's the, the same yeah. corridor. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I don't know if they're here today, but we're going to get those folks in eventually. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what that tells you is that um, there are a variety of stressors out there, and yeah. um, you know, hive management is important, um, and making sure that you you know talk to your neighbors and and work with farmers. You know, I, I think farmers were kind of unaware that early cutting of their their alfalfa, they were more worried about feeding their cows, not thinking about their were robbing bees of an early source of an important nutrient source. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I think that there is that conversation, and, and I know that dairy farmers are aware of this issue and. Um, are looking at those buffer zones and what they can do. So they, they can plant in the buffer zones. To and Bear Crop Science is a, a, one of the companies um, that produces this particular insecticide, and they are working. Um, they have a, a bee program, and they are giving away seeds of uh, pollinator um, attractive seeds to be planted in and around spaces. They give them to homeowners. And so I meant to bring you some, but I forgot. Um, I'll bring you some in the next few but days. They, like to plant in buffer zones? Yeah, you can or plant them in your gardens. They're just, you know, trying to encourage yeah. the availability of quality forage for bees, for bees all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Uh, questions from the committee? Uh, Margaret, how often do the manufacturers change the chemical kind of formularies? Is there kind of an ongoing look at it? Yes, so it's always ongoing. Um, that, to get a to get a chemical through the EPA is a is a pretty extensive process. And to be honest with you, um, I, I actually toured the Bear factory out in California a couple of years ago. And the thing that they're actually working on now is um, creating plants that basically protect themselves more, so that they're you know everybody's looking to use less um, pesticides overall. Um, and so they're looking at different ways to not through genetically altering plants, but through breeding plants that have a stronger ability to withstand mm -hmm. an incursion, you know, a bite by a bug, which, you know, an, in a corn plant, if you, um, if you get, if it gets bitten um, by a bug, there's the potential to get uh, a fungus growing in there, and that's we get aflatoxin, which then causes abortions in cows. Um, and so that's why we're kind of rabid about protecting our, our uh, corn plants from any kind of bug incursion. So it's pretty important to keep those Plants healthy. healthy, right? Exactly. And the more that the plants can protect themselves, obviously, that in the long run that saves farmers because you know nobody wants to be paying for pesticides anyway. No. Um, but the the new the new thinking um, from all of those companies is moving more into um, plant protecting themselves and being better able to withstand the the problems that are associated with insecticides and well with fungus issues. You know, it's 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 fungicides, insecticides, rodenticides. Um, you know, so there's a wide variety of Pesticides, they all fall under that same category. So, I just want to be clear you, you're saying that from what you've seen, that neonicotinoids are not necessarily the, the problem, but you are saying that there's bees are under a lot of stress. Absolutely. I, and, I, and I think everybody would agree that there are a variety of stresses. Pesticide use, not just neonics, but pesticide use in general, is an additional stressor, right? If you use an insecticide, that has the potential to impact a bee. You know, that's, it's an insecticide. That's what it's designed to do. And the way the way to lessen that stress is to properly use that product and to use it, you know, in a you know to manage it properly. And I think that there are other things that um, Vermont can do, and this bill envisions that to uh, try to remove or bolster the other stressors that are out there. Any other questions for Margaret? No, I don't remember. I, I had a question. I don't. Remember, I, I don't remember because um, I only saw it once. But the uh, whatever it was called, the committee that was put together, the pollinator protection, protection committee, protection yes, committee came up with a variety of recommendations it is. that yep. obviously didn't end up in the bill. I was just wondering if you could speak to that at all. I don't know because you went to those meetings and what some of those recommendations were. I'm not saying you agree with them, but correct. Um, so. 
Right. So, I mean, I, I think that those recommendations were, were fairly broad and they are some of the things that I've talked about, which is to um, work on better availability of um, forage for bees, work on the issues of um, genetic diversity. Um, certainly that one of their big recommendations that I don't agree with was no prophylactic use of neonics that you'd have to prove that you have a problem if you wanted to be able to use the product. Um, I think now, that those, those are really the big ones. How, how much involved in proving that? So you have to do soil tests. You'd have to go out to your fields, to all of your fields, and do a variety of soil tests, and you try to find if you have the early stage of the wireworm in your field. Um, and I think that that used to be a more precise thing before climate change kind of hit us, because uh, wireworm is significantly impacted by wet, cool springs. You know, this is the perfect kind of weather for them. We've had more cool, wet springs lately, and so we've had a, a larger amount of those early stages survive in the spring than we used to. Um, so it's much harder to predict what the potential negative impact of those fall available, you know, the, the, that you can test for in the fall. Anything else? Uh, any other questions? No. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, Ross, uh, Yes, sir. Good morning. You have uh, Dancing Bee? Dancing Bee Gardens is the name of my company. Yeah. Uh, well, you can explain all that, what you do, and, and how your bees are, or what you um, have. And... Well, basically what I do is try to make the world a better place. Not just for myself or other people, but for all living things. And I do that by working with pollinators and the incredible relationship they have with the plant community uh, through pollination and collecting the pollen and the nectar as well as water and tree resins. Um, they give back through pollination. So there's all kinds of fruits and vegetables, nuts and berries, and food in abundance for all the insects and animals and all of us. Um, and I, uh, so as a result, I, uh, I'm a beekeeper in Middlebury. Um, I have a relatively small beekeeping operation to do it natural, organically, without the use of chemicals and pesticides, antibiotics, artificial diet, that kind of thing. And to do that effectively, you can't be too, too large. You can't have too many hives because it takes extra care. Um, and so I want to, uh, my name is Ross Conrad. I want to thank you for having me. Um, and uh, first of all, you need to know that uh, the best data we have, the bees, bees are definitely <coughs> This past year, 2016 to 2017, uh, according to the Bee Informed Partnership, which does a nationwide survey of beekeepers, Vermont lost approximately 48 percent of their honeybees that that year. Um, and it's sorry, what year was that? 16 to 17, 2016 to 2017. That was the most current information we had. Um, we lost 48 uh, percent in Vermont. Um, nationwide, the average is 30 to 40 percent. Um, that was unusually high. Uh, a lot, as you heard, um, there are a lot of stressors. Um, the weather's a big factor, forage, disease, pests. Um, there's a lot of issues. Pesticides are definitely one of them. Neonicotinoids in particular because they are the most widely used of all the insecticides. Um, in particular, the seed coating, um, that's probably the biggest issue just because the, most farmers don't realize what's on these seeds. They just, they know they plant them, they grow like crazy, it's great. They're not told, they don't understand. But the reality is there's a, a, a neonicotinoid called clothianidin, and it is 10,000 times more toxic to insects than DDT. This is according to the research. 10,000, so it's very effective. It kills insects like crazy. Not so harmful for people, so it's very popular. Um, unfortunately, uh, some of the breakdown products are also top, just as toxic as uh, some of these neonicotinoid breakdown products are just as toxic as the actual. And um, the other issue is that because they're systemic, they're water soluble. As the water gets on the, the, the seed, the pesticide dissolves in the water, the plant, as it grows, takes up the pesticide. So it goes throughout, it's in the pollen, it's in the nectar, the bees get exposed that way. But 
only three to five percent of the pesticide actually gets absorbed by the plant. Ninety-five or so percent of the pesticide on that treated seed goes into the soil, and it can last for years. It's water soluble. The water will dissolve it, and it will start to move with the water underground, and other plants pick it up. And so you, we've had issues with trees on the edge of a field, and you know dead bumblebees under it because that tree is now highly dosed with, with the pesticides that is picked up inadvertently through this drifting of the pesticide through the water in the ground. Um, and they're super, super toxic. And also the evidence has shown there's a clear correlation that exists between dramatic increase in honeybee losses and increase in neonicotinoid uses. Um, so I do want to kind of stress that as a beekeeper, yes, it's an extra issue for the bees, for my bees. But depending on where you are, depending on how you manage your bees, it can be somewhat mitigated. Yes, it, it adds to the cost for beekeepers, extra labor, extra work, to make up for the colony effects of the mucus noise. But overall, I, you know, we're managing, because we're trying to stay in business. We're working extra hard to make up for it. My real concern are the native pollinators, the wild bees, the bumblebees, the moss, the butterflies, all those other critters. Um, that, that's a real issue. Um, our Department of Agriculture is starting to find these are, neonicotinoids are turning up in our waterways. We don't know what it's doing to the waterborne insects. And then the uh, domino effect of how does that affect a fish and the, and the birds that, and, the, and the bats that feed on these insects. Um, so, so there's some real issues here. Specifically, I'd like to just make some comments addressing H915. Yeah. Right. Farmers, I think, do need to have the option to easily be able to purchase untreated seed. Right now, for all intents and purposes, they don't really have that option. Uh, it's really difficult. And so they're having to use pesticide on their land, whether they need it or not. Extra cost, extra impact on the environment, even when it's not necessary. It makes no sense. We need to do something to change that. Um, another thing uh, that has been brought up by the Pollinator Protection Committee, which I was a member of, by the way. Um, and one of their recommendations is that consumer access to the nicotinoids should actually be eliminated, if not reduced, uh, at least reduced, if not eliminated. So what would that mean? Um, basically, you, you can't apply neonicotinoids unless you're trained, for example. Um, it turns out that the uh, concentrations of neonicotinoids applied by consumers can be hundreds of times that that a, an agricultural setting that you'll find. And so that's kind of an easy one. Other states have done this. Maryland has passed a law that um, doesn't allow consumer use of neonicotinoids. Uh, in in uh, Oregon, the cities of Eugene and Portland have passed laws that restrict consumer use of neonicotinoids. And that's because, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's because I might I don't know if I'm saying if I say this right, but I might buy some of this stuff down at Agway and just spray it along on my bushes. Yeah, and you just overuse it. Right, you know, they're not trained. They think a little is good, so maybe a little more is better. Right. They're worried. They want to protect their plants. Right. And, and, and it can have uh, pretty delirious effects, side effects, especially the native pollinators. Um, you need to know that, uh, in my opinion, H915 should refer to all systemic pesticides, not just neonicotinoids. It focuses on neonicotinoids because they're the most uh, popular and the most common, but uh, it's kind of a loophole. History shows that whenever regulation or legislation impacts one chemical or class of chemicals, then the industry simply creates new chemicals or classes that do the same thing and often has the same problems, and this just requires you to go back and revisit the issue again because you only are dealing with neonicotinoids, ones, and now there's these other um, classes. And in fact, there, there are uh, other classes already available um, that are causing problems for bees. Fipronil is a phenyl parazol, and sulfox, sulfox, sulfoxaflor, excuse me, they, they just name these things really hard. Why do they use those for? Um, I don't know offhand. Um, but they are similar to neonicotinoids. They're systemic. I'm sure Kerry could probably fill you in. Um, uh, and then um, 
they, they act in the same way, though. They, they bind to the same receptors in the nervous system of the insect, and um, they don't break down readily, so they clog up the receptors and cause serious problems, even at low doses. Um, another product is fluffy radiforin. It's a substance manufactured by Bayer, um, and it's under a class of insecticides called butanolides. Um, and according to the Pesticide Research Institute, floppy retiforin acts uh, just like neonicotinoids, has a very similar chemical structure despite being classified as a butanolide. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, like neonicotinoids, floppy retiforin is systemic, so plants absorb them distribute the toxin to the stem, leaves, pollen, and nectar. It's highly water-soluble, moderately persistent in the environment with a half-life of five months. So I would strongly suggest the wording of this bill be changed to, to apply to all systemic insecticides, not just the endocrinoids. Also, uh, the wording in section four makes it impossible, actually, to reliably evaluate the impacts of treated articles on pollinators, in my view. Um, the secretary, it says, you know, Secretary of Agriculture shall assess the effects of neonicotinoid treated seeds and on the loss of pollinator populations in Vermont by independently reviewing claims of pollinator losses by beekeepers. Sounds reasonable. Unfortunately, the ability to evaluate the effects of neonicotinoid on honeybees can only reliably be done through testing in a lab to test for the actual chemical residues or the breakdown products in bees, pollen, honey. Wax, that orient or native pollinators. Uh, it's really difficult to know whether your bees are weak and are sick because of a pesticide or you know maybe it's nutrition or something. It's just really hard. And, and we don't really have the infrastructure in place to do regular testing on a wide mass scale, as far as I know. At least we I know we don't probably have the budget for it. Um, uh, the other problem is limiting the agriculture departments to reviewing claims of pollinator losses by beekeepers allows the ag department to totally ignore the impacts on the native pollinators. We're, you know, right now we've got an army of people out there caring for honeybees, feeding them, giving them a place to leave, treating them when they're sick, you know, taking care of them. No one's out there caring for the wild pollinators and the bumblebees and all the other pollinators out there. And, and all the indications are they're being decimated. You know, you used to drive down the road and get insects all over your car or windshield, right? Have you noticed that doesn't happen much anymore? There's a reason for that. It hasn't happened much this winter. Well, not in the winter, that's for sure. <laughs> Even in the summer, though, when it's supposed to happen, right? Um, and so uh, the other thing that 915 talks about is um, tracking. Uh, well, actually, no, it doesn't, and this is the thing. I think it should. Um, it turns out that Vermont, I think, needs to start tracking the use of all treated articles that have a potential to impact pollinators. The first step in understanding the impacts of treated articles is to track their sale and use so we know the level of treated articles that we are releasing into the environment on a yearly basis. Right now, we don't really have a good handle on that, I believe. Um, the Vermont legislature has broad authority to regulate pesticides in the state, including treated articles. Uh, the regulation of treated articles includes authority to use the Vermont Pesticide Advisory Council to develop best management practices for the use of, um, of treated articles, and the best management practices should include tracking use and sales, not only of neonicotinoid treated seed, but also of nursery and bedding plants that are treated with neonicotinoids. So I, I thought a couple of years ago the legislation passed a bill that Totally, you know, a better way of putting it, the Pesticide Advisory Board to develop regulations around these neonicotinoids. Is that correct? You know? My understanding is it just well, it gave you the authority to do that, but it never actually, or, and if it did do that, I, I don't believe it's been done. Right. Let's put it that well, way. That's what it is. We told them to do it. <laughs> so, but they never got not that I know. In fact, um, the last I heard, the Department of Agriculture wasn't even sure if uh, bedding plants and nursery plants should actually be classified as a treated article. And I pulled up uh, 40 CFR 152.25, um, which is the FIFER regulations, and it says that an article or substance, part of the definition of a treated article, an article or substance treated with or containing a pesticide to protect the article or substance itself. 
So it seems really clear to me that those should, as well as seeds, nursery plants, bedding plants, should be treated as treated articles as well. See, um, I thought, and we had testimony earlier, that um, corn and soybean were the two main treated seeds here in the state. And that like garden seeds and those uh, were not many treated. Carrie, did, did, did you report on that or no? Somebody. That sounds accurate, um, but what I'm talking about are the bedding plants and the nursery plants, not the seeds, but actual, you know, we had uh, some of the bigger box type stores that sell plants that are good for pollinators. It turned out there was a big hullabaloo uh, when we found out they were treated with these systemic pesticides. So people wanted to help the pollinators, they buy the plants at the store, they plant them, and, and they're toxic to the pollinators. And it's, it's kind of an issue, especially because there's no labeling. I mean, there was no way for them to know as a consumer. Um, so, so, so we got some issues here for sure. So, um, were some of those plants that you're talking about were they treated with neonicotinoids or just with others? Exactly, neonicotinoids. Yeah. I brought some um, copies of, of basically the points I just yep. um, covered for each of you. Thank you so much. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to. Oh. Well, it seems, it seems like we're here, well, we're here conflicting things, obviously. Because um, the last witness seemed to be saying that it was one of the advantages of the way it's used now is it's the, the seeds are put into the soil, and so it's not floating around in the atmosphere. What you're saying is going into the soil is not necessarily a solution because it's water soluble and it comes back up. Is that exactly. my statement right? Um, they, the, the dust issue in Vermont is not as bad as out west where they still use the air pneumatic planters. Um, but yes, that, that seems to be the issue because it's water soluble and it persistent in, in the soil. It can last for years in some cases, depending on the soil, especially clay soils, which we have in Madison County, where I'm from. Um, it can last a long time and it can spread through the water and then the other plants just pick it up. So, so, so that's one of the problems. We talk about only mitigating the problem, but only like applying in a way that's not going to hurt the pollinators when they're not flying or something like that. It doesn't work with the systemic plants, uh, systemic pesticides, because once it doesn't matter when you apply it or how you apply it, the bees are still going to get exposed because it's systemic and it's in the pollen and nectar. And any pollinator that visits that plant after it's been treated gets exposed. So. You can't, you know, it's the idea is, oh, you know, you're going to only apply it when there's no bees around or that kind of thing. It applied for the other pesticides that weren't systemic. That worked. It doesn't work for the, the systemic ones, and that's part of the issue. So as corn grows yeah, and gets three, four, or five feet tall, if, if a bee or an insect lands on that corn, uh, they could pick up the Well, technically, yes, uh, through the pollen. But corn is not a major forage plant for honeybees. They, they will go to it um, on occasion, but it's not like a primary Clover. thing. Yeah, clovers, uh, you know, alfalfa, uh, basswood, black locust are big here in Vermont. The, the big ones are dandelions, clover, alfalfa and goldenrod, those are the main honey flows. But then the problem is bees, I should say, honey bees are, they're generalists. They'll go to any flowering plant that has nectar and pollen. So they'll go to the garden, they'll go, they go over, um, and, and inevitably they get exposed. So like in the spring, uh, you know, most people either grow plants or go buy plants to, you know, hang around the porch or wherever at their home. <clears throat> and I know it. at my house, um, the ones hanging around the porch, you'll see bees there all the time. How, how does a homeowner know if those are, those plants have been uh, put uh, neonics on? I think the only way they would know is if they talked to the person that grew them and asked them, right? As far as I know, there's no labeling. Um, there's nothing to prevent companies from treating 
um, no laws about it, so this really is, it's not easy. Yeah, I've never seen any bees most die off. Yeah, well, it takes a very high dose to directly cause acute toxicity for them to die right away. Um, that doesn't happen too often, I believe. It's more of this, the problem is, and as, as my handout points out, some of the research shows that there's sublethal effects. So they get exposed to a little bit, and it may weaken their immune system, makes it harder for them to forage. In fact, research has shown that when bees go and are exposed to neonics, they forage. They take longer in the field to collect nectar and pollen. When they come back, they come back with less than bees that aren't exposed. Um, it seems to affect their learning ability. It affect, we know it affects fertility. It affects their longevity in terms of their lifespan. And so, so you don't see them die right away. We just see hives that are kind of weak, they're not building up that great, we have to do extra things to support them and feed them extra and it's extra work, you know, but, but so we're keeping, you know, the reality is the number of bees hasn't declined overall because every summer we take our survivors and we split them to make up for all the losses in the winter. As I said, unfortunately, the wild pollinators are being decimated and from all the research that I've seen, it, all the indications are there's serious problems and that they're, there's an imbalance going on. We're seeing some pollinators, wild pollinators, uh, populations are increasing, but other ones, we're not finding them anymore when they used to be very common just 15 years ago. And so it shows that there's, there's something that's causing uh, an unbalance, a disturbance in the population numbers. And so some of the pollinators, I guess, that maybe have less susceptibility to these neonicotinoid pesticides are filling in the niches that are being opened up by pollinators that are dying out. That's my understanding. Yeah, right. So Ross, I'm just gonna try to understand. Um, Margaret listed, I think, four things that affect bees. You mentioned that we've lost almost 50% of the colony here. Um, if you had to rank, whether it's lack of diversity, lack of forage for them, climate change and pesticides, I think were the four, uh, are the pesticides the most likely to have caused that loss? Um, I would. And I know they're interconnected. To me, pesticides and climate change are the two top issues, they're because they aggravate a lot of the other issues of pests and diseases and forage problems. I mean, pesticides. One of the pesticides are herbicides. They should clean out a field of all the weeds, which we lose a lot of forage that way as well. Um, so, so the, that's one of the problems. The, the pesticides aggravate disease problems because they make they affect the immunity of the pollinators so they're more likely to get sick affects the forage uh, not only their ability to forage but the amount of forage um, it affects uh, actually pesticides have been shown to cause in, in honeybee hives their development time from egg to adult to to take longer than normal and we have a mite that is affecting the bee the varroa mite and it feeds on the baby bee as it's developed. So the longer time it takes for that baby bee to develop, the more the mite can raise its young successfully and more mites can get raised. So it aggravates the mite problem. And so, so not only are pesticides a problem in itself, but they aggravate all the other problems. So that's one of the reasons why to me it's one of the biggest problems. The other issue, of course, is climate change. Not only, as we heard, are um, plants blooming at different times, at abnormally times than what they used to, but, and not only do we have extreme weather events that can directly impact you know, heavy winds or floods that can impact hives, but it turns out scientists have proven that in a high carbon atmosphere, plants on Earth produce a lot more sugars and starches and less protein. And they've established that in goldenrod pollen, the level of protein in goldenrod pollen is much less than it was 40, 50 years ago today because the plants just aren't producing as much. So, so there's a nutritional problem there. Again, it weakens the bees. They're less able to f deal with things like pesticides and the, all the other stuff they have to deal with. It's, it's a very kind of complex because everything's yeah. interrelated. Yeah. Um, but the, the thing about the pesticides is the one thing we have control over. We produce them, we put them in the environment, and, and we, we, we make them and, and, and use them. And, and we can do something about that. It's hard to do something about diseases and pests and, and the climate that we don't have direct control immediate, like we can actually do something. So I really encourage you to do something. You know, we've been talking about this issue for quite a few, I know two, three, three years ago I came and testified, at least over in the house. 
and, and nothing has really been done yet. So please, I, I encourage, I, I kind of I to beg, but we need to do something here. Uh, really, I, I strongly urge you to, to do something. Well, any other yeah, questions? I, I don't want to open a whole can of worms with this, but all this conversation is making me wonder about what we would market as organic honey. Seems, well, does this make yeah. that hard? Oh, well, it's already extremely hard. You can, as I teach, um, you can manage your bees organically without the use of pesticides and antibiotics and artificial diet. What is hard is keeping them in a location where they're not going to forage right. on anything within a couple miles around in every direction that is treated with you know, chemicals or synthetic uh, fertilizer or something which would infect or affect the organic integrity. And so as a result, the only uh, appreciable amount of organic honey uh, there used to be one beekeeper in Vermont that was certified organic, but he's not doing it anymore. It's just hard, you have to keep them like in the forest and there's not much honey in the forest. So the only organic honey in the United States really comes from um, Hawaii where there's an island that's kind of isolated and you can do it. Otherwise, it all comes from other countries that, that you can hear that's available. The last thing, you said um, maybe the state of Maryland did the consumer thing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is that the only other state? Uh, the, I, I, you know, I meant it, I didn't have time to, was it Connecticut? I knew there was one other one. Um, I think Connecticut, right. I knew there was one. I didn't know if it was Connecticut or, or, or it, Minnesota. But. They did the consumer thing. Basically. Yeah, just for consumers where consumers really can't, don't have access to it anymore. So that's, that's at least a first step that can be done. Um, and hopefully, I'm talking with farmers, to, like I said, just trying to educate them more about the issues because we know there are other ways to control wireworm. Um, we have organic growers that are doing it, and as was pointed out, you can uh, sample the field in the fall to get an idea of what kind of infestation rate you're going to have in the spring and therefore know whether you need to use it or not. Um, so I, yes, it's extra effort, but as a beekeeper, I've been making an extra effort for quite a while to make up with for the problems of the pesticides that other uh, people in the agricultural community use. And you know, I, I understand we're all trying to make a living, and I don't blame the farmers, quite frankly. It's, 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 the, it's the regulatory process that's broken, in my view. They, they're not doing their job. The EPA, we're counting on them to make sure these things are actually safe for the environment and for us. And as far as I can see, they're, they're totally a slip of the wheel. <coughs> Anything else? Okay. If not, uh, thank you. You're welcome to you know, stay and hang around. Yeah, thanks. I, maybe for a little bit, but I do have other things I have to get to. Yeah. So I appreciate you uh, making some time for me today. Thank oh, you. thank you. Thanks, Russ. Terry will be here until 10. Mike, all of you? Yes, sir. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I want to make sure that I address whatever questions you had for me, because you, you did ask me in, um, which I appreciate. And I just want to say thank you for having this topic on the table in the first place. Um, that's, not a, that's not a given everywhere you go. Um, so my name is Mike Bald in Royalton. I run my own company, um, Got Weeds. Is the name of the company, Non-Chemical Invasive Species Management, and I've been doing that since 2010, 2011. Thank you. You testified at our hearing in White River, wasn't it? Our I did. You endured yeah. that. I appreciate I, apl I applaud your patience. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I testified to the House in February, and I read my testimony, because that's what keeps me on track. I don't want to necessarily put you through that again, but I... I would happily read some pieces. I know the bill has changed. Maybe I would omit one or two points that no longer apply. Um, but before I start, I want to I want to echo what Ross said and and Margaret earlier. Um, very. This is all is very complex. I, I want to make sure I don't forget to talk about buffer zones. That's where I make my living. Buffer zones, and we have no clue what we're doing in the buffer zones. I got the pictures on the laptop. We can talk about that till the sun goes down. Buffer zones are critical, and we have no idea what we're doing there. And if NRCS wants to come in, and we can go head to head, I'll, I'll break out my pictures and demonstrate what we're doing that is just not getting it done. Um, 
and then the point made about, I mean, Ross championed the, uh, it's, it's not just honeybees, it's, it's the pollinators, the, the monarchs, that, that population had a rough winter by, by the report that I saw. The wild pollinators, I mean, basically bugs in general. They're having a rough go. Whether you measure it by the windshield or Germany's lost 60%, they've, they've documented it. Um, so it's a very complex world. If to answer your question on what is the, the number one of all, to me it's cumulative effects. I mean, the, all the different chemicals out there, and we're talking about neonicotinoids here, but glyphosate alters honeybee navigation. So if they're already having trouble with the neonicotinoids and they're coming back with a lighter load of pollen and nectar, if, they, if it takes them longer to get back to the hive, that's not helpful. I mean, we all know how long it takes to get anywhere in Vermont. So if you're a honeybee and it's just adding on to the time, that's not helpful. Um, atrazine is, to me, is one of the things, why are we doing that? Why are we doing dicamba and why are we doing atrazine? I mean, I'll mention that at my points here, but I've asked organic farmers, because I work for a couple of them. I'm the only guy they can find who can put his head down and dig potatoes until the sun goes down. Nobody else knows how to do that kind of work. So they call me. So I asked him once, I said, atrazine, how, can, how do you go grow corn without atrazine? He said, it's easy, Mike, you just have to cultivate. You've got to know your land, you've got to get out there, and you've got to actually, you can use machinery, and you, you can grow corn without atrazine. you just got to know how to farm. Ooh, that was kind of a tough point. Well, is there an acreage limitation? You do two acres. Does, is, it, is it no longer feasible at 200 or 2,000 acres? No, if you know how to set up equipment, you can farm, you can grow corn without atrazine. So he may, I've heard that from multiple people. That's not my world. I mentioned how complex things are. I have a hard time managing a garden the size of this table. So uh, I'm not bringing that particular expertise. But I wanted to echo those points um, that, that, that the previous speakers made. So again, I thank you for the opportunity to comment. I want to say I'm here today as a taxpayer, number one, because every, every nickel counts. I'm here as a parent and a citizen of the community. Uh, I don't golf, I do not farm, I do not work in the world of grant funding, and I don't stand, as far as I know, I don't stand to gain financially from the outcome of your committee proceedings, although I do eat daily. Thank you for creating a short-term pollinator protection committee. That was a big deal, a good thing. Again, not everyone, not every state does that, so that was a positive. <coughs> you met that need in 2016, and I want to thank all the people that served on that committee. Many of them were on their own time. I believe the PPC did good work. It opened a lot of good discussion. The membership was professional. And I will kind of sidetrack to say that the Vermont Pesticide Advisory Council is also an excellent organization, well-led, great discussion. It's not a, a council that exists in every state. So we have that here. I will then say the original intent behind forming PPC, Pollinator Protection, and the Vermont Pesticide Advisory Council. The intent needs to be served. I don't think that it has been served because the original goal was reduce pesticide usage. That has not happened. So great council, great people, brilliant minds at the table. There could be more minds at the table, but um, reduction has not happened. That's a problem, and that feeds into the cumulative effects. Um, <clears throat> I do just say that the, ge the general public today has no more of a clue than they did 30 years ago regarding the impacts of everyday pesticide use. Uh, I'm just here really to call upon you to elevate the, the pollinator protection and the VPAC. I, I call you to, to set the bar high and, and achieve the highest possible standard. So one of the very first charges laid out for PPC was the causes and occurrences of pollinator decline. That mission quickly became sideboarded into a narrow fo focus on neonicotinoids. To me, that's a fail. It was certainly logical and necessary to address neonics. And we've, we've heard you know, the need and the hazards this morning. I, I see it. I get that. But in leaving out atrazine, dicamba, and glyphosate, we have cleared a path for continued use of these products, even accelerated use in the, in the case of dicamba, which is heavily used in the Midwest. This is, again, a fail not to include those chemicals. So while I see some real positives in the legislation here today, I also see a need for broadening and improvement. Even Secretary Ross, back in 2016, called for full exploration of all causes of pollinator decline when he attended a committee meeting. 
when we omit something from the conversation, we set the table for all follow-on actions and discussions. Just omission by itself is, is, move, is putting it off the table. And it seems passive, but it's, it's a conscious decision. We pick and choose, again, some, sometimes subconsciously, but once a precedent is in place by inclusion or omission, those, are set, those decisions tend to dictate future focus areas. All right, I'll keep moving. Why is full exploration important? Dicamba, I'm going to go into dicamba and bring it back to bees. Dicamba's effects on insect populations is uncertain. And with industry making profits tied to sales of the product, we shouldn't expect a rush to identify impacts on insects. It's not, I mean, it's all about marketing. It's the lead over science. So marketing comes first, profit. Beekeepers in Arkansas last year noticed serious hive issues in areas where dicamba treatment had occurred. This is documented, and these are not hobby beekeepers. These are people with thousands of working hives. The bottom line is that dicamba use essentially shut down flowering for miles and miles around positioned beehives. There was no pollen. No flower, no pollen, and the use of this chemical had basically erased all viable habitat. No pollen means no protein. No protein means the queen of the hive stops producing young. I don't know the mechanics of that, but there are people in the room that do. No protein, no offspring. The same businessman noted that regions without dicamba use actually had a pretty good year last year. Why is this important to Vermont? Over the past two growing seasons, a company in central Vermont has begun offering treatment services to manage bed straw, gallium. I, was, I intended to bring one in today. I, could, I can go out and get one in my yard because it's everywhere. It's a little pasture plant, field plant. It's in the deep forest, Randolph floodplain forest under ostrich ferns. You still find bed straw. It's everywhere. We're not going to get rid of it. We tolerate it. It's not what we want, but it's there. People ask me, I say, forget about it. We have to deal with the other ones first. So here's the problem. If bed straw is virtually everywhere, every hay field, every pasture, what's the point in trying to manage it, and if you're not going to succeed, why spray or why treat? Why apply the chemical? The argument for using it is that you're going to succeed, you're going to successfully manage. But if you know you're not going to succeed or it's just going to come back in, what is the point? There is no justification there. Most, most hay fields do have bindweed, buttercup, bed straw, and a, and a variety of others. And we learn to live with it. But as long as we're moving around tractors and equipment and deer and woodchucks are running back and forth, that's our world, and we have, to, we have to accommodate that. So I'm just making a point there. Senseless use of herbicide is, is ridiculous, and I guarantee it comes back around either indirectly or directly to pollinators. Um, so I, I'm pushing, and I've, I've actually asked the Pesticide Advisory Council to, to just stop with the dicamba this year. Just stop. Arkansas did. After April 16th, no more dicamba. Minnesota said after June, June 15th, I think, no more dicamba. Because of its effect on broadleaf plants in general, it volatilizes out of the soil and drifts to the next farm or the next state. And it comes down in rainfall. So during the growing season, which is starting, let's say today, that rain out there is carrying up to 10 herbicides. United States Geological Survey. That's not my bulk data, that's USGS. That's all they do is. Now, dicamba. Is that on treated seeds? It's not on treated seeds. It's not on treated seeds. Am I right or wrong on that? Correct. Okay. It's, not, it's not a treated seed item. What I'm saying is, in this world of cumulative effects, I'm trying to broaden the perspective of this bill. If you make an argument for neonicotinoids, I mean, it's hard to like look at every inch of your pasture and determine if you've got worms here, weevils there. You say, I need neonics. Okay, got it. I mean, I, I'm all for mosquito spraying. Get rid of, I don't want triple E. I don't want Zika. Spray them. I get it. But if you're going to spray for mosquitoes and you're going to use Neonix or glyphosate, I will say then, why are you still using atrazine? When does it stop? I mean, how, how toxic do you want to make the soup? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll move on from that. Uh, the forecast for this year in the Midwest is for a doubling or tripling of dicamba use. Um, and that will make its way to Vermont in some, some form. The PPC has not given the above situation any consideration, in my opinion, whatsoever. 
because it chose to focus strictly on neonicotinoids. I could voice, I have already voiced concerns about atrazine glyphosate. The glyphosate one really interested me because it was first patented as an antimicrobial. I'll move on and I'll, I'll skip over this. Just will point out though that glyphosate, there is no legal limit for Roundup glyphosate in honey. Yet FDA is finding it in the majority of honey samples that it started testing in 2015. Most honey, your chances are better than not, if you buy honey off the shelf, it will contain glyphosate. USDA stopped exploration of other food products. So they didn't want to know if there was glyphosate in other, other food products. And there was an article, I think, uh, VPR. Uh, glyphosate is in pretty much all beer and wine. Sad news for those, uh, for the beverage crowd. Well, those beer drinkers, are, that's probably why they're so bad. I, I'm not going to go there, but could could be a, a could there could be a relation? Yes. Um, so I will say, PPC did as much as it could in the time that it has. The members explored issues in depth, and they arrived at meaningful conclusions. Some of which you have in the bill. I believe there was a request to extend the life of the committee. I think that happened. I would argue that the PPC needs to exist on a permanent basis in some form. Uh, that cannot happen without funding, which brings me to registration fees, Vermont state registration fees for economic poisons, that's the term used for pesticides. The registration fees are ludicrously low. Doubling the annual fee would be completely reasonable and would offer funding for a standing committee and some degree of enforcement. I can sit here now and tell you the lack of enforcement on many fronts is a serious concern in Vermont. We can look at photos, I have them on the laptop. If you want to see photos of herbicide misuse, if you want to see riparian zone, just ignorance and destruction and unfortunate uh, situations, I've got them on the laptop. I'm not in the world of enforcement, but I will share whatever you ask me to share. If, so my point, if Vermonters had a high functioning pesticide advisory council, pollinator protection committee, both people and pollinators would be much better protected than they are today. This is why I call us to, to raise the standard. Pesticides are dangerous. It is brilliant that Vermont has a VPAC, but in the meantime, there have been vacancies on that council. And I, I, I guess it's a dart, I'm throwing a dart at UVM College of Medicine. I've never seen them attend a meeting. I've looked back through the notes. College of Medicine in Vermont never attends, as far back as 2011, a seat on the Pesticide Advisory Council. Sorry to bring that up, and I'm sure they won't like me saying that, but that's the way it is. Why, why is that? If, if UVM was truly dedicated, dedicated to furthering things like integrated pest management and understanding the, the complex issues, they would attend meetings like this. I'm sure they don't have time or funding. It, it all factors in. I will say again, UVM uh, had a land stewardship program. This is what I do. I, I, I work landscapes. UVM had a land stewardship program. Brilliant. What is stewardship? I ask this question everywhere I go. What is stewardship? And I get all kinds of different answers. I, don't, I mean, I have my own answer, but I mean, you would say, all, all five of you here would say something different. What is stewardship? Well, I call it presence on the land. In Ireland, the students call it continuity, intergenerational continuity, engagement, commitment to managing the resource. I mean, that's what it is, but we cancel our stewardship program in Vermont. Who did that? Uh, from, according to Dean Wang, who, sent, who responded to my email, which I appreciate it, um, he said it was canceled in 2016 uh, for business, for, for financial reasons. Um, a university decision, to answer your question, Senator. Um, I'll just put it in perspective. The university of New Hampshire actually supports financially a stewardship network. University of Massachusetts is doing great stuff. University uh, out in Michigan. Uh, Michigan and Maryland are two incredibly progressive states. Um, all these other states are moving forward on the notion of stewardship, how to manage buffer zones. And I feel like we've stepped back. I will move past and get into the next point here. Um, any questions so far? Who pays, no, just, just a little. Uh, yes. Who pays registration fees? Who pays registration fees? Uh, manufacturer? Any manufacturer that wishes to register such an article, such an item in the state, has to pay that either every year or every second year. Every year, every year there's an annual fee. 
It's 100 bucks in California. It's 750 something. Like that. It's but it's good attraction. Yes. Um, annual registration. <clears throat> I just want to um, move past uh, what I've what I've learned from looking at that stewardship program and, and what we do at the university level, because I did actually challenge the idea of more study, and that's not in the bill, and, and we need more study. But I'm a fan of no more studies at university level that involve, involve four, four verbs. That's it. That's all you ever see. Assessments, inventories, surveys, and monitoring, and maybe report at the end. There's no doing stuff reports. I looked back through eight years of reports, and there were always assessments and surveys. And there were always sunny days and shiny, happy people taking and measuring how many birds do I see, how many insects. What's the compaction of the soil? But, but no <clears throat> blood, sweat, and, and getting after it. We need doing stuff. And I, I'll stop with that point. Um, <clears throat> I am impressed that the, that the golf course representatives were in hand for all the meetings. I, again, I think that the Pollinator Protection Committee, committee meetings had had good public participation and the interested parties throughout the state, dairy, golf courses. I think they all have a place in this. I don't agree that the bill as it is <coughs> says that some people should walk with you. You're no longer involved. No, you are involved. And we need habitat everywhere because it's complicated. And if you're farming, if you're, if you're chopping hay or chopping the field before the alfalfa flowers, I get this question all the time. Hey, Mike, when do I cut my field? When do I cut the roadside? I don't want to whack the bobolink, so I want to do the birds. I want to create. I want to preserve milkweed for the monarchs, but I got to get that alfalfa while it's the most nutritious. What do I do, Mike? I said that's the way it is. It's you got to do patchy. You got to you got to be out on the land. You got to be present, and you got to micromanage. But it's so complicated. You see how I. I mean, people don't want to don't want to damage the, the bobolink nesting habitat. Well, okay, you, you can't cut that field. You, know, you see, you see where the nests get mowed over, and people are doing good things, but it's so complicated. We need, that's my point. We need to start supporting people doing good stuff. I would argue that if you have a buffer zone that is dysfunctional and just you're not getting it done, then you forfeit your right to use pesticides, neo, neonicotinoids, and to get subsidies. As far as I'm concerned, if you can't. We know buffer zones are important, right? Right where it flows into the river. That's important land. If you're not doing it right, that's, that's where filtration happens and erosion control. If you're not doing it right, hey, get it right and come back next year and talk to us if you want money or support. Let me illustrate. This is new. If I'm facing north, roughly, and you're facing south, Senator, I've said this before to state folks, and it's just brand new to them. They don't, they, it's like, wow, no one's ever mentioned that before. You're facing into the sun. I'm facing out of the sun. I've walked the White River. The south facing bank is covered with Japanese knotweed, which bees love. It's an invasive species, and it actually is, is pretty destructive in terms of <clears throat> erosion and habitat loss, and just for its monoculture. It suppresses biodiversity. So you're on the north bank facing into the sun. You get full sunlight. That buffer zone, in order to get rid of the invasive species, that buffer zone should be 100 feet long, 100 feet wide. Yeah, where I live, the sun comes in the east and sets in the west. Right. Yeah. Okay. So most rivers, though, I'm with you. Many rivers in Vermont, think about the, the Green Mountains up the middle, many rivers flow east-west, right? Yeah. So that means there's curves, there's sinuosity, but there are banks that face south and there are banks that face north. Yeah. That's the, the predominant <clears throat> theme. I submit that north bank riparian zones need to be huge. They need to be heavy. 35 feet doesn't get it done. North on the on the north facing bank, so south facing out of the sun, the sun never hits the ground where I'm standing because it's got to come over the shoulder of the hill at a at a funky angle. It never actually hits that soil. This ground is 20 degrees cooler than your ground. O over here on the south, but you don't even need a, a riparian zone for the most part. 10 feet. So it's just this understanding of we, we try to bring riparian buffer zones and drop the model onto every your land, my land. It's got to be more in tune, and that's why we got to have people on the land with doing practicing real stewardship. Okay, I'm bringing it back around here. Where am I? I'm on IPM. 
You're almost out of time. I know. That's okay. All right. You shut me right down and ask questions. Do you have any questions at the moment? I'm going to make a point about IBM. I'm no, doing good. Okay. Integrated pest management. All tools are on the table. I have agreed with chemical use in some settings. I cannot to this day see how you can manage railroad corridors with people safely. So when they spray the rail line, I get it. I get the argument. Goats, I said we could use goats, but oh, nobody wants to run over a goat. Okay. Okay, I can see some use for pesticides and, and chemicals. But at the same time, Michigan uses a ton of fire. They, they run wildfire all the time across Michigan. Cutting, pulling, harsh language, goats, all the tools that I use, they, 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 they're second class com compared to the using the chemicals as, as the first choice. So I submit that if we actually had a clue about in integrated pest management, if we knew what we were doing, we would do this. We would remediate contaminated soil. Most of our soil, you go to Burlington where they're trying to do projects and they've got contaminated soil. Do we remediate the soil or do we truck it, ship it to Coventry and throw it in another hole? Why? It's right there. Treat it. Fix it. We know how to do it. Plants will do it. Um, why are we doing that? We would also know where our soil came from. So again, White River, Route 14, Royalton, when they rebuilt Route 14, I do invasive species work in several locations right along Route 14. I'm on it. I'm on top of it. Except where they rebuilt the Route 14, because they brought in soil. And I respect Sue Minter for ask, answering my question. I said, Secretary, where did the soil come from when you guys rebuilt that road? Well, my cheapest bidder. I don't know where it came from. It's a low bid. Well, there's, they brought in six invasive species. And that, that little 78-year-old farmer now has to pay $800 a year to manage that. That's not fair. I mean, that's, that, that hurts. Um, we're working around that issue. Uh, Gender-confused fish. How does that relate to neonicotinoids and insects? Because we're, we, we, we aren't reading, we aren't knowing our history and knowing that the gender-confused fish we saw in Lake Champlain in 2016, north end of the lake, that were male, female, and, and everything in between fish. Well, what do we do about that? What's going on? They, they, did, they observed that in the UK in the 1980s. And here we are, what, what are we, 30 years behind? I mean, that blows my mind. Um, if we were on top of all this, the pesticides and the environmental considerations, the Vermont five-year cancer plan would have included pesticides as one of the contributing factors in its 18 points. Apparently, we can all go outside and the only danger to us, the only risk is sunshine and radon gas. That's the only thing out there that could cause any cancer throughout your lifetime. I disagree with that, but I can, it's the disconnect is what I'm trying to get at. Where is it? Uh, keep moving. The legislature needs to unify some of this stuff. There was a hearing last year on atrazine. This year is pollinator protection. There have been bills submitted or proposed on glyphosate, and they're all different. They're all on their own track. Rachel Carson noted in 1962, silo thinking is a problem for our mindset. 1962, we were thinking in silos. She, she saw it. It's in the book. It's in Silent Spring, page 23. And here we are in 2018, and we're still in our silos. We've got to bust out with a box. I think I'm almost done. Um, I just want to go back to the point about cumulative effects. You would never know if I didn't come in here and say, I asked about glyphosate. I asked about atrazine. And it didn't make it into the committee notes. And it didn't make it into anything related to the bill. Why? I mean, Carrie's here on Department of Agriculture's uh, as, as their representative, and, and he'll speak to you uh, intelligently about all these chemicals. Um, but the point is, it all needs to be wrapped together. And there's, there's many more questions beyond just the pollinators. So my final point, uh, are there organizations already doing much of this groundwork? Yes. On, on pollinator protection, habitat, good stewardship. Yes. King Arthur Flower, the city of South Burlington wants to manage 210 acres that drain directly into the lake. They hired me, not that I'm here to self-serve, and I've told them, send out every kid on detention, every prisoner, every, every person that needs something to do, you send them out and I'll, we'll put them to work. 210 acres that drain into Lake Champlain will carry no chemicals into the lake. That's brilliant. 
give them 20 grand. Recognize cities and towns and certified B corporations that are doing good work. King Arthur Flower gets complimented all the time for their, their lovely, kind of wild, chaotic space, which is great for pollinators. And my job is to keep the wild parsnip and the wild turtle out, which is hard. But we use the native plants like burdock to, to help us out with that. So I just want to give recognition to people doing great progress. I already talked about Rachel Carson. I made the point about buffer zones. And uh, it's complicated stuff. I appreciate your work. I guess at this point, I would welcome your questions. Thanks again. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, Carol? I just want to, for your information, uh, let you know that I, earlier in the year, submitted a bill um, to, my bill asked to ban chlorpyrifos and uh, dicamba. Uh, it, we did discuss it here in the committee, and the agency came forth, and they have agreed not to register chlorpyrifos anymore. So that you know the um, the uh, the substance is working its way down smaller all the time because they're not producing it, they're not manufacturing it. So that's going to end but, uh, sooner rather than later in the state because of the uh, cooperation we've had from the Agency of Agriculture. Thank you, yes. Dicamba, yeah. um, uh, that I, I found out is, is used very little here in the state of Vermont, mm -hmm. mainly on golf courses. Of course, we grow no, virtually no soybean here. And uh, it, I, I think you probably know it's the drift that's the problem, the volatilization of, the, of that substance that's the danger. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and it's an economic impact. It doesn't have any, um, any physical impact on humans, but the economic impact of killing a vineyard or um, you know, stuff like that that I'm worried about, uh, that we've, we've had some agreement with the golf course owners to be careful with that and to look for other uh, chemicals that might work as well, but not uh, drift. The drift is not controllable. So I mainly wanted you to know that we mm -hmm. are familiar with uh, some of these chemicals. Glyphosate and atrazine, long story there. I won't even go there. We could have a good discussion on that. But um, they are also things we've given quite a bit of uh, time. And we. Uh, we, we are, I wouldn't say we're doing research, we're not doing research, but we're reviewing uh, what has been done and trying to read through it. Um, you know, the, the um, atrazine, the fact that Berkeley kicked out the main researcher there 20 years ago has a lot to do with our um, look, looking carefully and not taking too seriously his initial findings. He lied. Uh, so of course that did a, a lot of damage to whatever um, conclusions we might draw. I'll stop there because we are way over time, but, but we are uh, investing time and in trying to find out as much as we can about these. No, I salute that. I, I'm, I don't doubt that. And uh, I'm just trying to tie it all together. Um, so thank you for that. And I, I, economics is the driver to me, not the science. I, that dawned on me like five years ago. It's all about economics. How does glyphosate get in beer? because we're spraying the, the harvested material, all the hops and grains, we're spraying it with glyphosate to dry it out. To, not, to, not for weed control, but just to accelerate the drying, and then that gets into beer. So this little things like that, little steps, you know, trying to get preemptive and stop things from that, practices that make no sense from even getting into our state in the first place. And I, there is great work happening here, and I'm just pushing hard, because that's what I do. Thank you. Any other questions for Mike? Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Thanks, sir. Uh, Appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Terry Bradshaw. While we're changing witness and Mike, maybe you can call your buddy uh, Chuck Ross and then do some if the extension service do some studies on it. Do love studies. <laughs> <laughs> I love re real world application. Good morning. Good morning. Shall I start right in? 
Start right here. I think I'm supposed to say who I am, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm Dr. Terrence Bradshaw, University of Vermont. Uh, special, what is my title? Research uh, Assistant Professor, Specialty Crop Production, Fruits and Vegetables. Um, and I was chair of the Pollinator Protection Committee. Oh, you chaired that? I did chair that, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Chuck. Chuck gave me a sort of, I think, help to, to recognize that task to some degree. Um, so, as I said about a month ago when I testified in the House, um, that that was the fourth time that I've testified on some form of neonic or pollinator bill, and I hope that each next time will be the last one. I don't think this will be the last one, um, because I think this, this bill will, is not the last bill that's going to come out. Um, so <clears throat> jotted down some, some thoughts here, um, and I'm specifically going to stick to um, what the Pollinator Co uh, uh, Protection Committee put out in our recommendations yeah. and how it relates to H915. Um, so I'm going to try to stick to that framework. So <clears throat> the bill that I saw, which has changed fairly substantially from uh, the 688, I think it was at the time, um, or a month ago, um, is quite different and seems to, it's, it's obviously, you know, for political purposes, you know, things have been cut out. We've sort of you, you hope the best of the bill is going to carry through and that that's what's, what's going to pass. Um, I think the goals are laudable in the, in the bill, but I don't think they really get at the intent, the, the core intent of the Pollinator Protection Committee. Um, the, so the Pollinator Protection Committee, when we put forth our recommendations, um, it was very iterative, it was very open. Many of the people in this room have been there from day one, and I think they would agree that we spent a lot of time um, thinking this through. The general goals, and this was highlighted in the report, um, were protect pollinators, number one. Um, focus on managed and unmanaged pollinators, wild bees, kept bees. That was unique in Vermont. Uh, we were one of the few states that actually expanded our scope to look beyond just honeybees. Um, we were very clear that we wanted to focus on all of the stressors that are affecting pollinators. Um, Partially, you know, one of those many being pesticides, but habitat loss. Um, well, I'll probably go into to a number of these in a bit. Have climate change, uh, introduced diseases coming from managed bees, and there's so many different factors um, that we really wanted to to highlight. We highlighted, and I said, as I said before, um, we wanted to bring the best knowledge to the table. Not one of us at that table is a you know, pollinator specialist, well I shouldn't say that, Leif Richardson is a pollinator specialist and entomologist, um, but even he recognized that he needed to bring in the best information. I think we, we did. Um, and we highlighted a few things um, out of there. One is we found, we looked at the research, we identified gaps in the research, um, and then we highlighted that uh, we need to do more and there was a really important component of that, which I think is, is really gets the goal of this, um, which is to develop some kind of mechanism to have somebody carry forth this work um, at extension or at the states or somebody who's tasked not to be a corn specialist or an apple specialist, but to be a pollinator specialist. So that frames this. Um, so 915 seems a little bit strange in terms of the three particular planks that were picked out of that. They, they didn't really cover the overarching goal, and in terms of the specifics that were being put forth in terms of changes that, that were, are proposed to happen, those seem to be the big, the, either the low-hanging fruit or the big guns that we wanted to, to approach. Um, so I wanted to focus on that a little bit. It seems like, as has happened, when I first testified on, on some form of what this bill has become, in I think it was 2010, um, it was it was a neonic bill. We were looking just at neonic and neonic pesticides, um, and it now evolved into a more comprehensive pollinator protection bill, and that's that's what we came off of in the committee. Um, and now we get back to the, to the neonics, which is important without question. Um, and it's a it's a common theme that. You know, there, there's something we say in, in my world. I do a lot of science communication. I'm now teaching an ag policy class. Um, I work in conventional ag and, and organic ag with a foot firmly in both buckets. Um, there's, I, 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 I pay attention to a lot of different aspects. I also grew up on a dairy farm, pre-neonics, you know, in the, in the last, you know, last century. Um, 
the common theme that I that that I that that I would say um, all of the committee sort of felt, um, or maybe I should I should speak for the whole committee that a common thing that came up with me, or I would say that the theme that came with me that changed my mind a little bit in thinking was um, the data that came out. And Matt Shambaugh was here, I think, last week, um, showing some of it, I assume he showed some of his data with the, the neonic residues in, from tile drains. That was something that I think all of us in the room um, realized that these are, there was acutely toxic you know, uh, uh, amounts that were coming out in these drainage ditches. So there was an obvious problem in that particular use of this material. Does that mean that all the work of the Paul Mayer Protection Committee should focus on that drainage ditch? No, we should also focus on the drainage ditch. Um, and so looking at the first uh, uh, recommendation, which is to offer non-neonic treated, require that non-neonic treated seed be offered to, to farmers, absolutely, without question. I think that's a low hanging fruit. If a farmer doesn't want to use these, they can't. And so we need to find a way to help them do that. But that doesn't get anywhere close to teaching that farmer whether or not they need to use that, how to, how to use the tools uh, to determine the need for that, um, nor the tools that are, that, that are needed to manage the, the surrounding habitat. Um, so it seems like there was kind of one piece. It's a, that's a low-hanging fruit. I think it's laudable, but it doesn't. it's not the end goal. Um, the next piece. Was, and I spoke to this uh, uh, last time when both the current Secretary of Ag and the, the former Secretary of Ag were both in the room. Uh, and I said, uh, so this is the, the reference to the Secretary of Ag carrying out the assessment of treated seed on pollinators. Um, neither one of those individuals nor their staff, uh, and I give full credit to both of them, they're both smart, smart individuals. Uh, has the expertise to do what this bill is asking them to do, nor is this bill giving them the funding to do that, which is to uh, empower or require that they conduct some kind of assessment um, above and beyond what the, the professionals are doing. And when I say professionals, I mean uh, people around the country who uh, John Tooker, David Bittinger, Leif Richardson, our own, um, Jay Evans. I mean, there are people at USDA at research uh, uh, institutions that are doing this work that we need to be, be paying attention to them. So if we're going to actually make a legislative mechanism um, to ensure that expertise is coming in and we're adapting policy for that, we need to look at the experts and we need to fund either bringing someone in Vermont, funding someone in Vermont who can do that on a local basis, um, or we need to empower others to help us do that work. Um, and I think that the, the current and, and former secretaries of Ag both say, yeah, I, we, don't, we don't have that expertise to do that. So um, again, that's another piece that needs to be brought out. If we're going to empower someone to do this work, we need to fund someone to do this work. Um, and then finally, and this kind of taps off of that, the last one, um, the educational program that's proposed, um, a lot of excellent. That's, that's something that we were um, strongly recommending within the committee. But it was one part of a comprehensive uh, pollinator protection plan, which would be conducted by somebody who is science-based, who lives and breathes this, and again, a Vermont pollinator specialist. Um, I don't know what the funding mechanism, and I, it all comes through however things get appropriated, but my guess is, and my understanding from, from what's been proposed and what this might look like, it's not even close to the comprehensive education that's, that's really being asked. Um, or expected of, of uh, what it would take for farmers, uh, pesticide applicators, community uh, land managers to get the work done that they need to get done. Um, I guess that's my specific comments on that bill. I'm, I'm open to talk about the committee and our focus in general. Uh, again, I, I respect that this bill has made it this far. It's the farthest it's made, uh, and it's great, if, and, and some of the uh, I think each of these three provisions with some tweaking would make sense to pass, but really, to really get at what we're getting at, it needs to be more comprehensive. And, and, I, and I would say that to be more comprehensive, we really need to look at the funding mechanism to fund a professional in this state who can, from a science-based perspective, conduct real research and conduct real outreach programming. Um, and it was mentioned multiple times in the recommendations to fund a pollinator position at UVM Extension 
Um, I know that, that extension's got some, some funding difficulties, the state's got difficulties funding uh, you know, state aggregated projects, but this, is, this has been identified year after year after year as a pretty critical uh, uh, component of, of what we need to, to make this move forward. Yeah, Anthony. Well, what were some of the other recommendations from the Pollinator Protection Committee that you think would be doable? Uh, yeah, good one. So I, I brought out the recommendations list. Um, the, so the, it's important, and I think you know that most of the recommendations pass unanimously, or we call it by consensus. Yeah. Um, and those are, a lot of them were changing language and focus within existing programs. So a lot of discussion about ANR and um, to what extent we can work with NRCS or other programs to encourage you know, pollinator habitat as one of the components when we manage state lands, when we offer grants. That's easy to do, to include that language to empower people who give grants, who give loans, who manage lands, to, to, to expressly state that this is an important thing. So I think that's an easy thing to do that would have kind of a long-term trickle-down impact. It wouldn't cost any money aside from changing it. Um, some of the other items um, that, let me think of what some of the other items are that I want to cover. Um, a lot of discussion about very specific educational requirements, and it was more than this bill went into in terms of who we want to educate. You know, we need to educate pesticide dealers, pesticide applicators, the people who train pesticide applicators, homeowners, consumers, land managers, you're talking about golf course, you're talking about Apple, you're talking about multiple factors. Um, and there's a lot of different specific mechanisms for, that were, or, or educational um, mechanisms we're talking about that, that would make sense. But it's going to take more than you know, a couple sentences to cover. Um, another one that was not, well, I should say, I'll stick to the consensus stuff in terms of, we'll get to, to Munich. Um, one of the consensus material, uh, 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 I think really the only real con uh, consensus uh, recommendation was uh, some kind of moratorium on what was called uh, ornamental uses of Munich. Um, and that made, with certain provisions that were made that allowed the greenhouse industry, if they screened their greenhouses and whatnot, um, that we, we, we presented that and that made sense to the committee. Even the greenhouse guy on the committee agreed to that. Um, but nobody was calling for, for outright uh, uh, ban of them. The next, so if I'm going from consensus to general agreement, uh, the next level at general agreement, and that I think still has strong agreement, um, not just among the committee, but among others as we speak to them, is the classification of Unix as class A materials, restricted use materials. Um, I, so I work in IPM. I this morning was drafting the email that I always send to my grape growers, kind of start the season, think, start thinking about, you know, phlomopsis management. I make recommendations. I even recommend Unix at times. Um, I don't think anybody should be using pretty powerful pesticides without having some licensure and training. So making the Unix, or actually we suggested, I think it was any uh, materials that are classified as highly toxic to bees, class A restricted use materials is a, is a low hanging fruit. So would that go back to the conversation we had before about they call it banning consumer uses or something Right, like that. right. So class A would essentially be in, for all intents and purposes, would, would be in consumer use. I mean, any consumer can go out and get a license and, and right. become educated, and you hope that that process, the whole intent of that process is to educate people about the appropriate use of them. Um, it also screens out the people who are just going to pick up something at Home Depot and not ever read the label anyway, um, and not cross the threshold, you know, not even put the effort into it to, to take the exam and, and get it. So I think that's a, a low-hanging fruit that I was surprised that this bill didn't cover, because um, yeah. it seemed like a pretty simple one. Yeah, I don't know. We had Harvey over to explain this, I think. Never brought that up, but I would think that that would be something that could happen fairly. You know, easy. Yeah, um, I think of my other. Oh, this guy's sleeping. Okay. Um, the, I mean, the other real consensus material uh, list, for it, so that, that's, that's the big one. I mean, when you come back to 2010, when this bill was one sentence, this, the state of Vermont shall ban the use of the unicornoid pesticides in the state, that 
was that that goal was, I think, overreaching, but it got to the heart of the matter, which is we need to use things responsibly. We really need to think about integrated pest management, um, cost benefit, you don't base everything on cost, but not just economic cost, environmental cost, farmer cost. Um, and the solution can't be overly simple. So that was one of the, the suggestions was to, to class A, the, the, the highly toxic B, to B's materials. Um, Another one was, and this bill included it, offer farmers the, the chance to not use neonic seed because if you plant corn or soybean, you can't, and it's not available. Um, and then uh, require that farmers have some sort of quantitative uh, assessment of their fields before they use the material, um, which is fairly, is, well, so this would be similar to the wraps. Issue. So you, you can't use a phosphorus fertilizer unless you measure your soil and determine that you have a phosphorus need. Um, we, we recommended that not on a consensus, but I think on a strong, uh, I think what, the, what the term would have been, split opinion favorable. Um, the, but we can't do that unless we have somebody in the state who can help provide that information and teach growers how to do that. You know, Sid Bosworth is probably going to retire very soon. He's one of our agronomists. Um, Heather Darby is doing a, a million things and can't be tasked with this unless she's given funding to bring someone on to do this. And that would be the kind of role for either an agronomist or a pollinator protection person. And I think that's really, at the end of the day, what we came forward with is this is a complex issue. Um, it needs to be based on science and we need to hire or bring in a scientist who can see this through. Um, you know, one sentence and, and two sentence, you know, bills aren't going to get that, um, it, not saying this is more involved in that. Um, did I, I kind of answer your question? Yeah, that's good. Thanks. I, I was reading uh, this morning, um, you have a, is it Jean Erickson? Yeah, yeah. He did a study on precise feeding. Right, right. Um, it seems like if you can get money to do that type of a study, which I don't know who that's supposed to benefit. Right. I, I see it like a stick in the eye type of study. Right. Why we can't find money to do something like this pollinator protection stuff. Right. So I, I read the press release on, on John's study. I haven't read this study. You say it came out this morning. Um, and be careful with studies. I mean, I, I, I publish studies, and sometimes they're, they're, they, they look at the, the, not even the trees, they look at a branch on a tree and not the forest. Um, yeah, and when you hand that to Digger, uh, yes. he loves to throw dirt at stuff. Uh, farmers. Uh, and yeah. farmers, uh, what do they expect it's right. going to do but throw dirt at it? Right, right. Um, that's why it's more important, and I agree with, with what Mike was saying, um, to just commission another study isn't going to get anything, but to commission a person to look at the breadth of studies uh, and then take those to someone, and that's what extension is about, to farmers and say, this, look, this is the best science. John Tucker is a classic one down at Penn State, um, who would studies the use of neonics amongst many other things, specifically on agronomic crops and their effects on, on uh, uh, insects and other soil, you know, ecological uh, parameters. Um, and, but it's very Pennsylvania specific, uh, but he's out there doing that. And he's, and he's working with farmers, and he's actually one of the people who, are, who sort of first raised the flag from within, you know, this is the agronomist guy. These are the ones you thought were digging their heels and saying, you know, let us keep doing what we're doing. And said, you know, this doesn't make sense under this condition with this crop. Um, and we need more nuance to that. And to actually, rather than commission a study, um, hire someone to evaluate the studies makes sense. And so um, I'm, I'm not going to dig into the legislature's pockets to do this, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some money and some commitment to do it right. Is that a year-long thing? or? Oh, I'm talking about a permanent position. Well, Absolutely. If you've got a, you know, a vegetable specialist, you've got an agronomic specialist, you've got a, you know, apple specialist, you should have a pollination specialist. Yeah. Well, I know. And that's what the committee recommended. This, uh, yeah, it's a serious issue mm. that needs proper attention. Right. Uh, Carol. 
So we got this bill from the House. Uh, we haven't actually had a presentation on the on the, uh, the recommendations from the committee, directly mm -hmm. from the committee. Yep. So we need to do that. Um, minor. On other inst on other issues, we've had good cooperation from Minor. Mm -hmm. They generously <coughs> share with us their results, <coughs> no cost. And Kate Ballard mm -hmm. uh, is a good resource for us too. Right. And she was on your committee. She was. Um, I wonder if they would be um, helpful. I think they could be. I mean, I, I, I think that. And again, this is the furthest, it's, I think it's the, fir the first time that this particular bill has, has crossed over, right? In terms of actually taking action, I mean, it crossed over to create the committee. Yeah. But in terms of, of a bill finally making it to an action stage, um, so a lot of the work that's happened, and we've had count so much that I had to put it on my faculty workload, uh, the number of hours that have been spent, and I don't think that uh, we're, we're scared to, to come back across and, and to transmit some of that information over now that it's on the Senate side, uh, recognize that the recommendations were, were in a 67 page document. Um, yeah, it, now the recommendations were, I think, five pages. Uh, and, but there was a lot behind it. Um, and I mean, I'm open to, uh, I don't, the, the committee by, by statute dissolved. You know, it only ex existed until February of 17th, I think it was, of last year. Um, Many of us have come back. Uh, I don't think anybody's legislatively required to, but um, I don't think anybody's really scared to if, if we need to come back and, and provide some more testimony. Um, I would be careful not to try to rehash the whole process. Um, yeah, but I have the guy who claims to be the biggest beekeeper in the state in my district. Yep. He claims that there's no problem, that, that there have been no losses. Right. Uh, and then and the other thing, too, I mean, I could just make that as a statement, yeah. but you don't have to respond. Sure. But then the other thing is, you mentioned the um, the results, I can't remember if you said minor or, but it was co coming out of the drainage pipes. Right, right. Uh, they, they found these neonicotinoid chemicals in there. Did they, did they come to you with that, or did you just discover that? No, that, so that was, uh, Nat used to work for the state for, for the agency of ag, and, uh -huh. and he does water quality monitoring, and that's some of the data that he had pulled out. Uh, and so he, he was, I don't know if he was, he must have been invited, um, or he stepped forward to present the information. Was that the guy we heard from yeah. yesterday? Yeah, he was here okay. yesterday, sometime recently, because he- So that wasn't minor? He was no, he was, he was with the state when he was doing that work. Okay. He was an okay. agency of ag uh, uh, chemist. Okay. Um, the, yeah, so when we talk about bees, and that's, there, there's, a, a bee is not a bee is not a bee, and that's one of the uh, uh, differences with the Vermont process compared to other states, is in other states, they have just looked at Apis mellifera, honeybee. Uh, and we are looking at, we looked at a more broad, you know, pollinators in general, which includes everything from a, from a butterfly to a certain fly species. Um, so that's one thing to, to note, and the impacts that are being seen are being seen very differently on different, you know, certain wild pollinators, the populations are increasing. Many of them are decreasing. Um, honeybees, quite, I agree, I, I, I know Mike, and, and I know his, his, uh, his take on things, and I agree with, some, with a lot of his take on things. Um, it's much more broad than just neonics and, and whether honeybees are being exposed to them. And there's a lot more involved with, with uh, honeybees, especially habitats, uh, and how those bees are managed so that they're passing viruses back and forth. Um, they, uh, the varroa mite is, is number one, I would say, in terms of stressors on them. So I wouldn't say that action should be taken solely based upon honeybees. Um, I also wouldn't say action needs to immediately be taken in a hammer be, be brought down because we've measured something in a, in a ditch. Um, but I was, I was surprised by the, the, the levels of neonates. We're, still, we're talking parts per million, high parts per billion, um, but they were biologically active amounts. And that changed my thinking on this. Um, and made me think that we need, I, as I say, I personally load neonates in tanks at times, um, recommend to farmers how to use them in apple and grape situations. I don't do anything with, with corn. Um, 
but there's certain aspects that uh, when I saw that data made me think to get back at the core of what I do, which is integrated pest management, um, you can't rely on that jug to be of whatever material it is to be the first defense. Um, and when we have treated seed that is the only seed that's available, farmers don't even have a chance to use another option. At the same time, on the flip side, um, we are making great headway in what we call conservation agriculture, um, particularly with the use of no-till crops, uh, no-till cropping systems. Um, and that, I think, moves the needle on sustainability in farms far greater than anything we do to manage pests. Um, and we know that when you plant corn, soy, whatever it is, into a, you know, a killed sod system, your likelihood of having problems with some of the pests that you need, that, that neonics are used for, is higher. So we've got these competing interests. Do we, do we shift to conservation ag, no-till agriculture, and have more pests that neonics can help to manage, uh, or do we keep plowing? Because plowing is a pretty good way to get rid of those pests. But we certainly don't want to just sit there and plow. We recognize that that's a, a, a major issue. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Other questions for you? No, no. Well, certainly appreciate you coming Thank you. and giving us your time. Um, but we got we got a long ahead of us. You've got work to do. That's right. So do I. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, is Judy here? Yes, sir. Yeah. Judy's up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Judy Belairs. I'm a volunteer with the Vermont chapter of the Sierra Club and also co-chair of the National Sierra Club Pollinator Team. So let me start by saying that H915, the reincarnation of H688, is a shell of the original pollinator protection bill and in our view needs to be significantly strengthened in order to truly begin to protect pollinators. And we believe that restricting the use of neonicotinoid pesticides, or neonics, is a good place to start. As you know, the 2016 legislature created and appointed the Pollinator Protection Committee to evaluate the causes and occurrences to reduce pollinator populations in the state and to recommend measures the state can adopt to conserve and protect pollinator populations. That's what the bill said. One specific charge was to, quote, evaluate best management practices for application of neonicotinoid pesticides in a manner that avoids harm to pollinators. So that was a specific charge that they had. They submitted their report that you've heard about and in 20, 2017, last year, and nine are almost a third of the recommendations related to extremely toxic and widely used neonic pesticides. So first I'd like to talk a little bit about the scope of the problem and then uh, go into um, what other jurisdictions have done and then talk about a little bit about what I think we think Vermont can do. There's a global concern about the use of neonics. I've got a graph here that shows the no number of studies that are being that have been done on neonics, and you can see it's gone up significantly. What is that year? It starts going up. I can't read it. Well, t that's 2005, right oh. there, and that's about when neonics started being widespread use. Um, so, and the top number is 350. So. Um, and these are different studies on soil, on residues, on, on bees. Nationwide? Uh, nationwide, yeah. yes. It could be even worldwide, I'm not sure about that. So anyway, there are, there are a lot of studies because of the concern about the environmental impacts. So in 2015, 30 scientists from around the world looked at 1,100 studies and collaborated to produce this report 
the worldwide integrated assessment on the impact of systemic pesticides on biodiversity and ecosystems. And their conclusion was, overall, a compelling body of evidence has accumulated that clearly demonstrates that a wi the wide-scale use of these persistent water-soluble chemicals is having widespread chronic impacts on global biodiversity and is likely to be having major negative effects on ecosystem services such as pollination. There is an urgent need to reduce the use of these chemicals. Last fall, they updated their report because there are a bunch of new studies and they concluded that their original conclusions were verified by existing studies and even strengthened because of the existing studies. The scientific and academic now, community. Uh, the, I yes. don't want to mess you up on your testimony, but uh, <coughs> who, who commissioned those studies? These were uh, independent scientists, about 30 scientists from around the world, um, who came together and with various expertise and put together these reports yep. uh, based on studies that they've looked no, at. No research university was cutting that? I don't, possibly some of them were from research universities. Yeah, I, I know Dave, yeah, Dave Goulson from um, Sussex in England is a bumblebee specialist. He has uh, a section in these, in these reports. So they were all had expertise on pollinators. I can certainly provide you links to these reports. Um, what? If you want to look at them. The, the one that the second one you showed us that confirms the first one would be probably the most important, right? Um, it <coughs> goes or is into there a summary to those? There, there are executive summaries. If you that might, I might provide those that, if as you well. Could, that would be appreciated. Um, the second one actually goes into more. Um, you got a handout at your previous meeting about the fact that um, treated seeds aren't necessarily that effective. And that was based on this second report because a big section of this is alternatives to using uh, Neonex. So the scientific and academic community in Vermont is aware of the serious problems of, with Neonix. 44 individuals signed on to a letter supporting H-688, the House bill, urging members of the House to support restricting the use of Neonix. They represent fields of agroecology, agronomy, biology, chemistry, ecology, ecotoxicology, entomology, and sustainable sciences, among others. The Xerxes Society, which was founded 47 years ago, and I feel is the preeminent NGO working to pr protect beneficial insects, um, puts out reports based on science. And a sign of their credibility is they often partner with federal agencies, such as the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Transportation, to develop management guidelines to protect invertebrates. And their latest report is how neonicotinoids can kill bees, the science behind the role these insecticides play in harming bees. They look at existing studies on neonics, and they have a list of clearly documented facts from the studies, inferences from the studies, and knowledge gaps. And so in the House, they were questioning whether neonics are really bad for bees. So I thought I wanted to present you some of the facts that the Xerxes Society found in the studies that they looked at. And there are 23 clearly documented facts including neonicotinoid residues found in pollen and nectar are consumed by flower visiting insects such as bees. Residue concentrations can reach levels that cause sublethal effects through a variety of ap application methods, including use of coated seed, and in some situations can re reach lethal levels. Neonix can persist in soil for months or years after a single application. Residues have been found in woody plants up to six years after application. 
untreated plants have been found to absorb the residues of some neonics that persisted in the soil from the previous year. Neonics applied to crops, even as seed coatings, can contaminate adjacent vegetation, including the attractive wildflowers. That's a problem with buffer zones. If you're using neonics, it can contaminate adjacent vegetation. Products approved for home and garden use may be applied to plants at rates substantially higher than the maximum label rate approved for agricultural crops. Direct contact from foliar applications of the most toxic neonics has caused bee kills. Additionally, foliar residues on plant surfaces may remain lethal to bees for several days. And bee kills have been caused by legal applications to neonics to linden and basswood trees, and some of the applications occurred weeks to months prior to when the bees visited the trees. Honeybees exposed to sublethal levels can experience problems with flight and navigation, reduced taste sensitivity, slower learning, all of which impact foraging ability and high productivity. Um, obviously, neonics are highly toxic to bumblebees. Exposure to sublethal um, amounts can significantly reduce queen production. Um, tens of millions of acres of neonics are planted annually in the U.S. and Canada, and when applied systemically, have residual activity in plants for months or years. And there is, they're persistent in soil for months or years. And the water issue, um, they can move into water, have been found in a range of water bodies where they persist. They've been found in rivers, streams, wetlands, groundwater, puddles, um, and also been detected in irrigation water. So the conclusions of the Xerxes Society from looking at these studies is that existing research demonstrates many of the current uses can cause lethal and sublethal effects on pollinators and other beneficial insects, and applications should be limited until we have expanded data on how they can, how the plant can be treated and provide pest protection without exposing beneficial insects to lethal levels. Unfortunately, neonics are used in Vermont, just as they are everywhere else. The agency estimates about 8,300 pounds are applied through treated corn seeds. It's an estimate because they don't require reporting Treated seed, the use of treated seed. Another 15,000 pounds were used by commercial applicators on lawns, golf courses, and ornamental trees and shrubs in 2016, and that's up from 8,600 pounds in 2013. And no one knows how many pounds homeowners applied. I have an example of a product, a homeowner product, for rose and flower care. Um, it's made by Bayer. It says systemic, so that's a tip off that it's uh, got a neonicotinoid in it. It's got Im imidacloprid in it. So, what does that mean, systemic? It means it gets in the entire plant. If the you plant absorbs it, it's everywhere. It leaves, yes. Uh, blossom. Yes. Pollen, okay. nectar, even gutation fluid, which is sometimes you see little drops of water on leaves. Gets in there. Is that the outfit out of California? There, yeah. um, they're based in, in Europe. Yep. Yeah. Um, so there's five grams of imidacloprid in that container. Five grams, and you'd have to read it to know it's toxic. To there's no evidence that it would be toxic to bees, but on the container, but in the container, those five grams or about a teaspoon is enough to kill 1.25 billion bees or 275 tons of bees. And that's because neonics are so very toxic. Can I peel this back? Sure. Would you want to? I do. No. Go ahead. I, I didn't know there was anything back there. Oh, I did. Oh, it's 
in Spanish. I mean, I still can't see where it's from. Produced by Bear Advanced. Yeah, Post Office in Box, uh, Triangle Park, North Carolina. They have a lot of beach down there. <laughs> um, and those are granules that you, I, I haven't opened it, but I think it's granules that you just put up around, around the plant, so. You know, it doesn't say what what's actually in here. Oh, yeah, it does. Active it ingredients. It in I'm sorry, it won't necessarily say what's in there because it's not made for internal use. Don't mind a little loophole. Imidacloprid. Imidacloprid. It's one of the three main neonates. Mr. Bruxel, no. He's our chemist. It's the one typically in homeowner products. So that is a neonic? Yes. Somewhere I'd like a list of what of all those things that cl are classified as neonics. Oh, is glyphosate, natrazine, and that stuff? They're no, not. No, they're not. No, they're not. Those are herbicides, not insecticides. Okay. So, um, right. So you can go to the hardware store and, and get those products, and uh, typically homeowners wouldn't know that that's yeah. that would be toxic. Mm. My understanding is maybe some of the products have a warning on them, but this one doesn't. So, and I, possibly only the foliar products. I don't know how that works, okay. but the ones I looked at in my hardware store, store did not have the warnings on them. So, did you just buy that? Mm -hmm. How much did you ask for the cost? Or oh, no, it was about a year ago. Maybe, oh. maybe ten dollars. <coughs> we can check. <laughs> I hated to buy it and give them the money, but <coughs> for an example, I so that was ten dollars. Up and that would last a whole year, so the whole season. I, I I can't say for certain that's how much it was, and, and I I didn't look at the application fall. rates, but yeah. it says it's good for eight weeks or something. You and didn't you keep, buy that, do you? I I'm shoot. not going to use that. No, I, that's why I have it sealed, so yeah. nothing gets out accidentally. <laughs> so I have a pollinator garden, so. Um, so the last part of my testimony is about um, action in other jurisdictions and then what I think we um, could do here. So far, Vermont hasn't taken any action to restrict the use of these killing chemicals, but other jurisdictions have seen the light. In 2013, the European Union banned the use of neonics on bee attractive plants. Their scientific body has just released a new report confirming the dangers of neonics and it's expected that the 2013 ban will be extended and possibly expanded in Europe. Ontario now prohibits the use of neonic coated seeds unless a pest problem can be verified, and Quebec is following suit with that policy. Ontario also bans the use of all cosmetic pesticides, 120 different chemicals, which includes the three main neonics, clothianidin, imidacloprid, and thiamethoxam. I lived in Ontario for 10 years, and there was no apparent outcry from consumers when these products were banned. I think most consumers probably don't even, won't, won't even know that they're not So those would be a, a, a container like that, which the picture on the front tells me it's for rose bushes and ornamental plants. So that's what that, that sand would right. affect. Right. What am I going to do about the Asiatic beetles? They're awful. They, there may be other products that work on those. I don't know. But pollinators are pretty important. So I, I would argue yeah. that there are other yeah. options out there um, and that these could be phased out without a problem. Um, in 2014, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided to phase out the use of neonic pesticides on national wildlife refuge lands because of the concern they make whole plants, including the nectar and pollen, toxic. In 2016, Maryland and Connecticut banned the retail sale of products containing neonics. We heard that earlier. Here in Vermont, there's been no 
such action. Between 27, 2010 and 2017, there have been five bills introduced in the legislature to restrict the use of neonics, but none have passed. This year, H688 was introduced and it got code 40 co-sponsors in the House, 40 co-sponsors. The Agency of Agriculture has conducted tests on honeybee pollen and tested soil and water samples and has found neonics in each of them. And by the way, 70% uh, of wild bees live in the soil, so if soil is contaminated with neonics, that means they're getting a really good dose of, of a very toxic chemical. Legislation has been passed to evaluate neonics, this is again in Vermont, to give authority to regulate treated seeds and to prepare a report on pollinator protection. But none of these has resulted in reduced use of neonics. In fact, the use has almost doubled on ornamental plants, as I mentioned above. So we hope that the Pollinator Protection Commi Committee recommendations can spur some action in Vermont. Again. Uh, many of their recommendations involve neonics, pesticides, and no other issue received this kind of attention in terms of number of recommendations. Uh, the PPC recommended banning the use of neonics on ornamental plants unanimously by a vote of 9 to 0. That means even the representative of the Agency of Agriculture supported it because they had a representative on that committee. The PPC voted 8-0 with one abstention that all pesticides that are highly toxic to bees should only be available to trained applicators. And that's the restricted use class A, so you have to, you couldn't just buy it off the shelf. Uh, the Xerxes Society does have specific recommendations for policies that state and local governments can adopt to better protect pollinators from the use of neonics, and those recommendations include halt the use of neonic products by backyard gardeners and other unlicensed applicators, and halt aesthetic-only uses of pesticides. And they suggest that the high residues levels in ornamental plants may pose more blatant risk than agricultural use. Uh, because as you heard those, you can apply them at higher levels, and um, they, the plants remain toxic for months or even years in some cases. Um, they have an example of a rhododendron that's toxic you know, for eight months or something. So, uh, so we think the recommendations of the PPC are consistent with the advice from Xerxes and we don't see the need for more surveys or public service announcements that may or may not affect behavior. We think we need some definitive action to protect pollinators. So we would urge you to strengthen the legislation by adding provisions um, that the legislatively appointed PPC came up with to prohibit the non-essential and non-agricultural use of neonics. So thank you. Uh, uh, did you sit through uh, the deliberations in the House? I did. And do you? Do you have any idea why they didn't um, offer uh, the ban for a home use? Uh, was that discussed much? Or? Um, the only discussion I heard was, and I wasn't around when they put together 915, I missed that meeting, but on the discussion of H688, um, there was some discussion about a ban go over state lines and buy it somewhere else, but I don't think, I mean, Maryland and Connecticut passed a bill, bills, and I don't think people are even aware of what's in there, so I don't think they have any reason to go across state lines to get the products. So I just had a couple of thoughts. Um, even if we were to follow the other two states' example and make it so that folks couldn't retail that product. There are truckloads and flatbeds coming in all the time in the Home Depot situation. Wouldn't we still have a problem? That's my first question. And secondly, are you aware of any other states that have 
made that sort of not happen. I, I don't know how you would do that, actually. If you said to Home Depot, we're not going to take any more of the treated flowering plants and, and, and that, that come into the state. I'm and I'm not necessarily, I'm just kind of general question right, for everybody. Right. No, I, I, I'm not sure how that would be accomplished, but banning the retail sale of off-the-shelf products is pretty simple because you just make it a restricted use and they can't put them out on the shelf. Understood, but so. it wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't go from 100 to zero because there'd still be stuff coming in, right? On, if they're bringing in plants that have been treated with neonics, this is true, yeah. and as well as the treated seeds, which do. <coughs> are, do are there manufacturers that don't, that don't treat seeds? I mean, are they available? They are. Um, I, I looked online and found a, a place that had a list of about, I can't remember, maybe 30 different varieties of soy and, and corn seed and specifically listed which ones had insecticides and which ones didn't. And so you can get them without insecticide. I think there were about a dozen different varieties of corn and soy that you could get without the insecticide included. Are the prices comparable? Uh, well, they're, they're big companies like Bayer and Monsanto, so I'm assuming they would be. And uh, I've also, and Carrie has said, and I don't know if Carrie's here, but I've also uh, seen that adding neonics costs 6 to $12 an acre, so uh, additional. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I think the, the untreated seeds could be, the, treat, the seeds without neonics could be available pretty easily, but let me just say in Ontario, they mandated that the untreated seeds be available when they said you had to show that you needed to use neonics by digging a hole and putting some pieces of potato in the ground and then in the fall and then looking to see if there were wireworms and a certain, at a certain level then that verified you needed to use neonics. Um, but they also mandated that seed dealers had to first of all advertise that the seeds were coated, that some of the seeds were coated, so the farmers knew that, and they also had to advertise that they had untreated seed available for people to buy. And in, in this bill, um, it just says treated seeds have to be available, which means the dealer can has to be have the ability to call up and order some. So I would say that that's not enough public notice that the seeds are available. I would like to see more well, public notice. <clears throat> all they need is a bag, one bag of seed, and they'd have some available. So. Um, yeah. yeah, Ontario specified a certain well, percentage, I think, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I have to check on that. I have to or, check on that. Yeah. I guess they go by the count, don't they? Like a thousand seeds or per bag. Or, I think the bags are sold by the counters. Uh, other questions? Uh, yeah, actually, you, you had a document, a letter that you said was signed by 40 but the people who yes. supported the restriction of the access to the neonic mm -hmm. but when I read the bill, I don't really see the bill as restricted access to neonic no. I just wonder if you could comment on that. That was, um, that was related to the original bill, the House bill. That, you don't have to find that it. letter. Yeah, that letter spoke to the House bill, um, but it just shows that there are people in the scientific and academic community that see this as a problem. They think that we need to have some restrictions. Yes. So but I can provide. For that. some reason, the bill got got switched to uh, 915 to, mm -hmm. you know, from, you said it was 8. 688, it was a, the committee bill, it was a committee bill that they put together. Uh, so they didn't nine, do anything with 688. No, 915 is a committee bill. Right, right. Yeah. Andrea? Um, I, Andrea Stander, over Vermont, I'm Senator, thank you. Um, Based on what I saw and heard in House Committee of Ag when they were considering this, the reason they went to a committee bill was because they were facing the crossover deadline, oh. and H688 was not going to make it um, because it was a more comprehensive bill. They didn't feel they were going to be able to take the testimony, and 
get it through the calendar. So they made it into a committee bill, 19, and this was what the committee upstairs was willing to pass in the time that they had. But I think there was a sense that at least by moving it along through the process and giving your committee an opportunity to spend some time with it, that there might be the chance that this could actually get some action this year. So, so you guys are all betting on us. We're betting on the whole legislature, so we all got to vote on it at some point. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mike? If it's, if it's helpful to Senator Cogmore's question, um, People do uh, people do run across the river and, and shop at the big stores. I don't we don't need to name them, but um, and they, they come back. So I guess I'm curious to know. I just checked with Guy's Farm and Yard last week because I always say good things about them. They got their two or three. They got a, they got they're redoing. I went to go visit the one in Montpelier. They're re doing a re new layout. Guy's Farm and Yard refuses to carry for philosophical reasons. They refuse to carry Roundup Ready grass seed. And I say good things about it because I say that's the last thing we need is everybody around Lake Champlain plant your lawn with Roundup Ready because one of the one of the atoms in the molecule of Roundup is phosphorus. So when I talk about economics over science or marketing over science and even over legislation, it's like to make that point of you got to stand for something. And I I just salute them and I think Gardner's is also I didn't visit them yet, but so there's there's leverage with the guys farm yard and the gardeners. And I'm, so my question is, when you figure out the wording in legislation, do you have to actually ban a product when you know people could just go across the river, or would you ban the use of? Because you can control it at the, at the transfer station. When somebody brings that in, it's like, hey, no, no one's going to bust them on the spot. But It also seems to me, to me, if you have a problem and you guard it with some kind of pest, there's other products you can buy. You're not going to say, Gee, I want to buy some of the I think I'm going to New Hampshire to do it. Right. You go to Agway, you're going to say, what can you do for my Asian beetles? And they're going to give you some more natural or some, some other product that's not in the Onycotoids. I'm not, it's one thing to say you're going to go buy some big item in New Hampshire to avoid something, but I don't think I don't see people going over across state borders to buy that stuff because they're not going to know it exists. They're not even going to know it's there. So why would no, they go they're going to call them their local store. Right. They're going to ask what to do about the past, and the person's going to give them something to do to do it with. Andrea? Uh, just a further clarification. I think there, there are two issues here. One is the app, the direct application of the pesticide. The other is people buying plants, ornamental plants for the most part, that have already been treated with neonics. So the, the whole plant itself is toxic. Um, and that's the part where I think there was discussion that if Vermont said we're not going to allow the sale of those treated plants anymore, that people would go across the border to the other Home Depot or whatever to buy their ornamental plants, which was part of the reason that Carrie Jaguer testified to the fact that the, the agency is committed to this public service educational program because a lot of people don't understand the nature of these plants. They just know they want this particular plant. In fact, the, the irony is, is people are buying flowering plants that they think are going to attract butterflies and bees and stuff, but they're actually buying the ones that are treated with the neonics, which in no. fact represent a toxic you know, thing in the garden. So there is a lot of lack of knowledge out there, um, but it is two issues in terms of restricting the use of the application of the pesticide versus restricting the availability of these plants that are already toxic. Um, there are alternatives, obviously. Carrie testified to the fact that they are disinclined to go for bans. The agency is disinclined to go for bans because they feel that just pushes people toward other products and that the marketplace, the agrochemical marketplace, will come up with something else that it can be used. And I just wanted to answer your question, Senator Brannigan. Bayer is a global corporation. Their home turf is Germany. They have a US corporate headquarters in New Jersey and 56 locations around the United States well, where they make things or operate things. That's helpful. So that must be, yeah, they must be everywhere. That 
the address on there was North Carolina. Um, right. Well, they have 56 locations in the U.S. where they are making things or distributing things. But their corporate offices are in Jersey. But their global headquarters are in Germany. Yeah. <coughs> their German, German corporation. I, I've spent the time just reading the label and the suggestions on the label. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't we hear, well, with your testimony and with other testimonies that if we're trying to ultimately have the concern for the bees, as an example here, that it is the uh, insecticides and pesticides and that kind of thing which is directly or indirectly killing them. Our intention was to grow a nice rose but not mess with the bees, but it through various ways that's happened. I wish, and I'm not being funny now, I wish I was able to uh, talk to my mommy for just a, a little bit. She's now deceased, but all I can think of is a trellis about the size of this wall and about the height of this wall during growing season of her roses. And I don't remember any bare advanced or anybody else's containers. Um, there's a way. And if there was some kind of way for us to get it back. Yeah. You, do you remember her putting them in a jar of kerosene bugs? Oh, the bugs? I don't. Yes, yeah, I don't. Get up early in the morning and they're quiet. You had to have uh, healthy uh, plants. I I don't remember that. I, I, and I again, not trying to be funny, but she was one who believed in talking to her plants. And you could see a difference. If she brought somebody's plant home and how it started to thrive versus wherever she got the plant from. Um, Too bad she's gone, you can take some down to get them rejuvenated. Well, she could run a little business. No, no, she just do it because she liked it. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Judy. We thank got you, Mr. we got to get Maddie on here. She's got two bills. That's good stuff to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> advisor for NOFA Vermont, which again is the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont. Um, I actually would love to just pick up on your point, Senator Brooks, that uh, as an organization that represents and works with organic farmers, um, I think that's one of the key things that we think about in terms of this bill is that there is another way. There has always been another way. Um, there are 620, as of the end of 2017, certified organic farms in the state of Vermont who do not use neonicotinoids um, in any form, um, whether topical applications or treated seeds. Um, so I think, you know, as an organization, we understand and definitely appreciate that there is a variety of um, farming practices and methods on farms in the state. Um, we are never the ones espousing that all farms in the state should, should switch to organic, um, as, as much as some people might uh, assume that's our position. But we do often stress in these kinds of discussions, um, and we stress the same thing with water quality and soil health, um, and it's especially true in the case of pollinator protection, 
um, that there are lessons in organic agriculture that can be widely applied um, to other farms in the state. Um, as I said, you know, these farms have, have found a way to get by and to um, be successful producers without the use of these chemicals. Um, so as I said, we know it can be done. Um, the pests targeted by neonics, I think you know, others have probably testified uh, to this fact. They're not widely and consistently present in Vermont. Um, and as Judy mentioned, there are ways of testing soil to actually you know, aff affirm the presence of the pests that neonics are there to, um, to target. Uh, so I think a more targeted approach is definitely appropriate in terms of these chemicals. Um, and I will echo what a lot of folks have said this morning, that the current bill, as it's currently written, is not enough. Um, it's a really, uh, it is a shell of the former version, H688. Um, and I think it's really important, and I know that you all understand this is a serious and important issue, that we need to be actively protecting pollinators um, and not just trying to you know, slightly reduce our harm um, year after year. And I think as it's written, this bill is really barely going to reduce harm. Um, I think we need to definitely take a more active approach. Um, as I mentioned, I know that you understand the seriousness of this issue. And I think it's really important to remember that protecting pollinators is not just for the sake of beekeepers or fruit farmers, um, it, or to give us the warm and fuzzy feelings. Um, it's really a critical ecosystem service that, that serves everyone um, in our state. And the, just in terms of um, you know, economic benefit, the amount that the state derives from pollinator services dwarfs any amount that the Agency of Agriculture receives in pesticide registration fees. It's, it's really a critical service that we need to protect. Um, so in terms of specific recommendations, I have will echo a lot of also what's been said, and I think was said in the House side, to my understanding. Um, I think that there are specific aspects from 688 that should be put back into this version of the bill. Um, and those include registering neonicotinoids as class A restricted use pesticides um, that should only be available to farmers and licensed professionals. Um, it doesn't feel like I need to harp any more than uh, has been stated already that these, that these chemicals don't need to be in the hands of unlicensed professionals. Um, homeowners are using these at much greater application rates and without instruction or training. Um, which is really dangerous um, as compared to farmers and licensed um, applicators. Um, I think also we definitely support the recommendation or the requirement that folks selling treated seeds, seeds also offer untreated seeds. Um, and this is an area, again, where there's a lesson in organic. Um, organic farmers are not allowed to source seeds coated with neonicotinoids um, on their farms. And again, there's 620 producers in the state who are able to buy seeds that are not treated. Um, and organic farmers, there's kind of, there are some specific requirements where they are uh, required to do at least a certain amount of searching to find um, certified organic seed, which is not necessarily always available. So in some cases, certified organic farmers are forced to use um, conventional seed, but they are not uh, able to use treat, seeds treated with neonicotinoids. Um, so again, I think it's important to remember that these untreated seeds are available at least to some extent already, um, and I definitely think that they should be more widely available. Um, and again, I think, as other folks have stated, along with the availability of those untreated seeds needs to be this educational campaign that, um, that H915 does begin to get at. Um, and I also think that we would support um, Ontario's approach, as Judy mentioned, um, that the sellers of the seeds have to you know, make it clear which seeds are treated, make it clear that there are untreated seeds available, um, and that there be specific thresholds for the amount of untreated seeds that they're selling, um, so that it's not just uh, you know, giving lip service to that idea. Um, I also had supported in my previous testimony on H688 on the House side, um, Terry's suggestion that there be a permanent position for a pollinator um, specialist in the state. I think that's a really um, important approach and that's kind of an active step that the state can take in um, not only voicing its support for this issue, but you know, writing it in in a more permanent fashion so that we uh, are, are being active on this issue um, year after year going forward and not just um, continuing to study the issue without a significant result. Um, I think that's it.
We didn't have a lot of additional specific recommendations beyond what's already been said, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Carol? Do you know if we ever had this position before of the pollinator person? In the last 10 years, we've cut a lot of positions out of the agency of ag. We've never had I don't believe so, no. But yeah. Carrie, uh, you know, he looks after the mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. if he's got anyone over there that it's capable or if he has to have a person. Uh, he, I don't even know if he works long or if he's got a group. Uh, yeah, it, my feeling um, is that there, I don't know that there would be the capacity within the existing agency staff to really focus on this issue in, a way, in the way that it needs. Um, I know that Carrie, you know, focuses on agricultural chemicals, but this, and, and I think Carrie does know a lot about this issue and focuses somewhat on it, but I think this position needs to take a different approach. Um, and I think we really need, do need to go beyond just assessing chemical use on this issue too. I mean, I know that as Terry mentioned, a lot of the, and as Judy mentioned, a lot of the Pollinator Protection Committee's recommendations were tied to chemical, chemical use, but um, that's not the only thing that we should be doing. And I think having a Pollinator Protection Specialist position um, would allow a person that can sort of look at that issue from a, from a higher level and approach it from a lot of different angles, including education and outreach. Um, and also making recommendations on chemical use. <clears throat> did, did you say you have 600? 620 as of the end of 2017 certified organic producers. But, and they're getting by okay. Yeah, and about 20% uh, of the state's dairy farmers are organic also. Um, yeah, yeah, and they're <clears throat> not you, utilizing these chemicals. Also, I'm a home gardener, you know, and I, I was, See, the big thing that we've heard about agricultural use is uh, it's mostly corn, corn and soybean, right? And so do you have any idea what the tons per acre of corn a year folks harvest a year? I don't know that figure off the top of my head, but I could certainly get it for you. It, it would be good to see if I mean, if there isn't much of a difference between treated seeds and non-treated seeds, uh, you know, why would we use treated seeds? Especially in such a broad-based kind of prophylactic form. You know, I think right now, since there aren't other options for producers, that's what's being widely used, and of course that makes sense um, that that's what's happening right now because there aren't other options. But I think yeah. education and just the availability of untreated seeds could go a really long way. Um, and I also think that's still going to be just a first step where, you know, everyone might not switch over right away. Obviously, you know, farmers are used to purchasing what they're used to purchasing, and it might take a while for folks to switch over. Um, but I think, you know, what we find a lot in, um, kind of shifting farmers' practices is that once even a small group of people kind of takes that step, farmers really learn from each other. Um, and if folks are able to be successful using untreated seeds, word will spread that that's a viable option. Uh, yes. On that point, um, in Ontario, after this went into effect where they had to, dealers had to carry untreated seeds, the first year um, they found that 24% fewer acres were planted with treated seed in the first year, so that once the treated seed was made available, even though they weren't doing enforcement, people, farmers were buying it, and yeah. the redu it really reduced the acres right away. So. I was thinking if, I mean, I don't know where we're going to call it this, but if you gave it like a four-year or five-year phase in, uh, to get people used to having to order <coughs> untreated seeds. And the other question, of course, we're going to have to ask is, you buy untreated seed, are they going to buy products and go home and mix it in a wash tub or something, mix this corn with these chemicals, um, and dump it in their planer and go plant. Uh, you know, we got to get that figured out too because that might be worse, you know, than the treated seeds. Uh, our first or second witness said that 
now they're putting some kind of a coating on the seed so that these additives will stick better so you don't get the dust in, in the air, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, a, you know, it's not an easy problem to solve, even though know, we got to tackle. Well, I don't think, I think especially in terms of agricultural uses, it's a little bit of a, a steeper climb and it's a more complicated issue, but I think in terms of homeowner use, oh. to me that doesn't really seem very complicated. No. It just seems crazy that people without any training are able to use these chemicals. And I, I agree with what's been said that I don't think folks will even miss them um, once they're not available and that just getting them out of the hands of homeowners will reduce the, the issue significantly. Yeah. And that's fairly common. I mean, there's a lot of things that are class A that consumers can't use, right? Right. Um, yeah, I believe so. I mean, you'd have to talk to Carrie or, you know, someone with more knowledge of that list, but I'm sure there are other things that, that are restricted in that way. Um, and this seems like it definitely fits in that category to me. And the Colony Protection <laughs> Committee felt the same way. Uh, yeah, I just have to tell you, as sort of a person that doesn't grow, much of anything. Mm -hmm. uh, grow grass, though. Yeah, I do grow grass. But I've heard you complain about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I would go to, and again, I without mentioning any particular big box store, I'd go there because my wife liked to have stuff that looked good hanging on the porch. But it never even dawned on me that there would be anything in there. <laughs> and, I mean, there were little things that I thought were miracle grow or something. And so, I think you're right, and others have testified that way, that I think 90% of the consumers have no clue that these are in there. They just, they buy them and they hang them up and if they look good, that's all that we well, wanted anyway. Yeah. Well, you have to bring home what you're told to bring well, home. Well, yeah. I, when you're the male. Well, I got that part really you well got understood. Well, in direction. Well, <laughs> Senator I, Brooks made that. No, Senator Brooks made the point, and you got to go out and tend to your roses and actually put the time in, rather than just buy it, hang it, done. Correct. It's about putting in the time. Mm -hmm. And also, I think uh, it, you know, supporting like local nurseries. And I know there are some folks up where I live in the Moyle County who are uh, who run pollinator nurseries. You know, who specifically are kind of small local businesses that are on, you know, an organic farm, for example, who also have a pollinator nursery and they're not using these these chemicals. Um, so some of that could be improved by just, you know, more education. Um, but I think we need to go beyond that. And the, I'm thinking of Hardwick. That's not the county, but um, uh, high mowing. High mowing. Yeah. It's in Walcott. Yes, Walcott. Um, yeah. They're, uh, yes, they're in the oil, and they're uh, an organic seed producer. So they don't sell uh, nursery plants, but they sell organic seeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And they're, uh, you know, becoming a pretty uh, large, you know, national <coughs> force in terms of organic seeds also. Mm -hmm. um, you want to switch gears? Sure. If you all are ready, I'm ready. Do you You're ready? Do you have copies of 903? I brought mine. I brought mine. So that this is in regards to the Vermont Environmental Stewardship Program. Yes. Yeah. Um, so on this bill, on H903, I'll start with sort of an overarching, a couple of overarching comments. Um, one is that. My feeling overall on the issue of, um, you know, soil health and regenerative agriculture is that we're sort of circling a lot of different ideas on how to approach this issue and how to um, really uh, improve our, you know, carbon sequestration and our soil health and our water quality um, in the state. But I don't know that we've kind of uh, hit the nail on the head yet with the with the exact approach that we should be using. And I personally also have been sort of. Uh, in a learning process, at, and we at NOFA have been in a learning process trying to learn from different states um, and different initiatives the approaches that people are taking that have been effective. Um, I feel like this bill is a good start, um, and I think the best thing about this bill and about the Environmental Stewardship Program is that um, it could make a lot of good progress on providing baseline data um, in terms of some of these metrics that, that the program um, includes. And I think that should be a key aspect of any bill that we um, pass 
in terms of working toward regenerative agriculture. I think starting with certain measurements to provide baseline data is really important so that we know where we are now and we know uh, we can see progress based on you know whatever approach that we do decide to implement. Um, and I think last week um, Peter Donovan came in and testified or at least was on the schedule too um, and I think he's someone that has done a lot of work on gathering baseline data um, and would be a great person to um, to get input from if you haven't already in terms of um, what those metrics should be. Um, so in terms of the Vermont Environmental Stewardship Program that this bill um, would put into law, uh, I think again that it makes good progress on developing that baseline data. Um, I think that I, I really appreciate that it's inclusive um, and that it would include a variety of farm uh, scales and type and geography. Um, as I testified on the House side um, regarding the previous regenerative ag bill, I think it was H661, um, we don't think that the state's approach should be limited to only targeting one particular type of farm. Um, even though you know we obviously support organic practices, we don't. We do think the state's approach should be broader and more inclusive and kind of bring everyone along. Um, so that's definitely something that we appreciate about this program. Um, some questions that I have about the environmental stewardship program. Uh, it's unclear to me whether it will facilitate you know real direct financial support both for farmers who are already implementing these practices um, or what exactly the level and the nature of support is going to be for farmers that need to implement conservation practices. Um, my second question is, and this isn't in the bill itself, but it's in a uh, document that describes the VESP program uh, on the agency's website. It lists, um, and this may be a, a question for Ryan Cash, it lists other incentives um, beyond just financial assistance through NRCS, which include something called CEAP, and a BMP challenge. Um, and I would love to get more information on what the exact incentives are, again, that this program would offer to farmers, because I think that's a really key part of uh, what could make this effective or not effective. Um, and and my, my last question, I guess, in terms of that is uh, whether the state has considered you know, paying farmers directly for ecosystem services that they're providing. Um, that's something that we often hear from farmers, and I'm sure you've had conversations about this, uh, that you know, farmers, a lot of farmers are already doing a lot to provide ecosystem services. Um, they don't even get a thank well, they did after our winter conference this year, actually, we had people write uh, love notes to farmers, um, thanking them for their work, yeah. You ought to send those to Digger. <laughs> <laughs> we should, actually. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Um, they do something positive for a change. We know that, and we really do uh, understand that farmers are struggling and in crisis, um, and that they are uh, feeling really piled on um, right now. So actually that kind of brings me to my first uh, concern about the VESP program. Um, in reading through the program and its details of how it would be implemented, it seems to me like it would really add pretty substantial paperwork um, and, and burdens around inspection um, without maybe providing sufficient incentives, especially during this time when farmers are in crisis um, for all kinds of different reasons and while farmers are really struggling to uh, meet new regulatory requirements. Um, I think this. This program, as much as I think it's intended to be, and it is voluntary, and it's intended to be incentive-based, um, but it reads a lot more like a new regulation to me um, than it does a really strong incentive-based program. Um, I'm also, one of the concerns uh, around this, this program and other uh, efforts to incorporate regenerative ag across the state um, is the potential to see even more increases in herbicide use with um, with wide-scale transition to conventional no-till agriculture. Um, obviously, tillage is a huge problem, and organic farmers till maybe more than anyone, um, so that's something that there's been a lot of increasing research on with on organic farms in recent years, is um, how do organic farmers till less? And since organic farmers are not able to use chemicals like glyphosate um, to kill their cover crops, there's a lot of research and I think really productive um, progress being made on organic no-till methods that use mechanical uh, means of killing off that cover crop. Um, and I wanted to recommend Gabe Brown as kind of an expert in that area who uh, may be able to provide some insight. Who is he? Where is he? 
Um, Gabe Brown? Yeah, Gabe Brown. I, he's been um, kind of on a speaking circuit around a lot of the different NOFAs and, and um, organic farming conferences, uh, educating folks about um, no -till, organic no-till practices. Um, so I can find more information about him if that's helpful. Um, and then I guess in terms of specific suggestions uh, related to those concerns, I think it would be interesting to explore what other direct kind of financial incentives can be provided to farmers to kind of get them started on this on this path. Um, and again, I think a pilot is is a good approach. I think that starting small makes sense and kind of seeing what the outcomes are, you know, with these 10 or 12 farmers in the first year um, would be good. But I do think um, more financial incentive or other types of incentives might be needed to really get farmers on board. Um, and then again, like I said about the, um, the pollinator issue, farmers learn from each other. So I think if we can begin to, if the state can really invest directly in incentivizing farmers to move toward these practices, farmers like, which often happens in organic agriculture, once a farmer transitions, they really see, oh, this actually is an economic benefit to my farm to have tr transitioned to organic. Um, not only because of the higher market value that they can get for their crops, but because um, certain practices like cover cropping and cro crop rotation actually save them money on inputs, um, and it increases the health of their soil over time, um, which is a really critical investment to make in their farm. Um, so again, I think starting with more direct financial incentives uh, would be great because I think farmers will then um, see those economic benefits for themselves and they'll learn from each other um, why these practices are beneficial without the state having to continuously um, pay farmers necessarily to do these things. Um, so again, one of my recommendations would be to explore and invest in organic no-till practices um, to avoid increased, you know, uh, water pollution from herbicides, which is, has been a documented result, actually, um, of the uptick in conventional no-till practices. We've seen um, increases in herbicide use um, following that, that switch, which is tough. You know, we do want to see less tillage, but then there is kind of that unintended consequence um, of increased herbicide use. So I think we should be considering that. Um, Lastly, in terms of suggestions, the regenerative farming definition used in the bill, actually in the VES <laughs> program, um, includes increases biodiversity and ecosystem health and resiliency. Uh, and I think that it's important also, and this really dovetails in well again with the pollinator protection issue, how can the state assist farmers to invest in biodiversity um, in addition to soil health? Um, crop rotations and crop diversity on farms should be considered as part of this effort. Uh, I think just you know the, the basic rotation from corn to soybeans and back again uh, may not really be enough to be called regenerative agriculture. Um, even if we are reducing tillage and, and making improvements in other ways, I think um, more diversity both in cropping and on, um, in terms of you know, pollinators and other habitat that's being provided on farms those things really need to be considered if we uh, have a true commitment to regenerative agriculture or regenerative practices. Um, and then in terms of kind of going back to just sort of for your information, um, NOFA and several other groups uh, in Vermont actually are participating in a, soil, a Healthy Soils Policy Incubator project right now that was started by the uh, California Climate Action Network. Um, and the goal of that project throughout this year is to explore and really create a community um, where state state leaders or um, folks working on healthy soils policy can learn from each other um, and share experiences uh, in terms of what's been done in their states, what's been successful, what has not been successful. Um, and there actually are several of those similar initiatives going on right now where states are really working hard to um, share amongst themselves what's been working um, to help inform healthy soils policy across the country, because uh, there are a lot of folks working on this nationwide right now. Can you give us some contact information? For the, the CalCAN, the- Here in Vermont, yeah. For the, what those um, state, or those nationwide networks are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that is all I have. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, Question. Also, Mr. Brooks. Do you see? Um, it's a question that sounds like you got to rehash what you just said, and that's not what I mean.
regeneration programs are farming can apply to any farms. Would you say? Would you agree with that statement? Uh, I think we would think of it as sort of a. We tend to think of um, farming practices as kind of a spectrum. Um, and I think our goal at NOFA has always been um, not to be kind of strictly team organic and only supporting organic, but to support farmers moving um, along that spectrum sort of toward organic practices, um, and in some cases even beyond what is specifically required within the organic standards, because there is, it's possible to go beyond that. So I think it's possible for any farm to move in a regenerative direction, but I don't think there is a very clearly defined um, you know, set of, of practices or outcomes that, that are consistently defined as regenerative. I think there's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done actually around clarifying that. Maybe I can turn the question around a little bit. Are there any farms that, that you could not go to uh, a regenerative uh, farming method? Um, I think there are a lot of farms that I would not call regenerative as they are being operated now. Um, I think for some farms, it, again, it really depends on how you're defining regenerative. Um, a lot of people, you know, some people include um, farmer and farm worker, you know, justice issues in the definition of regenerative in addition to, um, you know, soil carbon sequestration um, and more issues focused around soil health. I think the, more, the most common definition of regenerative agriculture does circle really closely around this issue of soil health um, and building topsoil year over year as opposed to losing topsoil, which is what a lot of our you know, industrial kind of conventional um, agricultural practices do right now. I think that's the most, the most common way that farms can be viewed as regenerative is really increasing their topsoil and building their soil health. And I'm not trying to put you in that category or so consequently uh, using your definition that you just mentioned a few moments ago dealing with soil and the health we have here uh, five uh, five farmers all having what you would say are five different farms in the sense of what they produce, how they produce it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to stop them from going to a, a regenerative process if they aren't at the moment. Um, there's nothing to stop them from working toward that. Again, I think it's a spectrum. I think there, there should, and, and I think there should be an entry point for any farm from where it is now to become more regenerative um, by tilling less or by putting in, you know, pollinator strips or, or buffer zones. Um, again, I think it would be hard for me to point to any one farm and say that farm is regenerative because by whose definition um, is it regenerative? And there are a lot of farms who are very, you know, further along on that spectrum in Vermont than others. Um, but I think there should be an opportunity for any farm to kind of enter that, that world and, and move toward those types of practices. I'm not trying to dodge your question. I just sincerely don't feel like there is one standard. There is. Well, until I become emperor, there's only one. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. As soon as you get there, we're all going to do that or all. That's okay. We'll have to start working on drafting that now then. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> all right. We, we took the, the main thing down Monday <coughs> off the dome. We're we'll going to put him back on. <laughs> <laughs> and when we get that, he's going to be the emperor of agriculture here in Vermont. Right on the dome. That's another permanent position we need, emperor of agriculture. And what I say goes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else, Maddie? No, not for me. <clears throat> Any other questions for the committee? Also, thank you. It's always well, nice to listen to her. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank for you very much. Coming in and giving us your time. I appreciate it. I was. Uh, Thanks a lot to everybody yeah. for coming this morning. Um, so I guess.